Hello YouTube, and welcome to this video analyzing the philosophy of Dune. This right here is my favorite book of all times because the knowledge that it contains is almost infinite. And so what I'm attempting to do today is in truth impossible because I'm going to try and present the philosophy of this masterpiece to you guys. And since I know that some of you might not be versed into philosophy, I'm going to try and make it as accessible as possible. But some of the concepts I'm going to be discussing are still going to be quite complex. So I'm going to be taking my time. It's going to be a very slow and long video. And I'm also going to give you a ton of context. So oftentimes I will go into the book and I'm going to read you quotes directly from the text so that we can really take our time and dissect all of the wealth of information that is present in this story. It will be beneficial for you to use the timestamps to navigate the video if you feel lost. And if you cannot consume the entire thing in one go, which I perfectly understand, know that you can just put the time that you left off at in the comments and that way you have a placeholder. You can come back to this and click on it and I'll put you right back where you left off. So that's a nice trick to use for videos that are as long as this one. If you click on this video, I also suppose that you know what Dune is or that you at least watched the movies. So I'm not going to be explaining any of the story to you. This is not one of these videos where the guy just tells you the plot of a book. I don't quite see the point of that. You can just read the, read the book for yourself. Instead, I'm going to go deeper than the plot and try and explain to you guys what the plot means in terms of philosophy. If you have never read the book, of course, I encourage you to read it before watching this video. That should be logical. But if you're the type who just watches movies and who wants to learn more about the things that were not in the movie, because the movies left off a ton of things, including philosophy, then this video is the right one for you. However, and this is very important, note that this analysis only concerns itself with Dune Book 1. All right, this is, this is it right there. And Duke book one was adapted in Dune part one and part two. I will not be revealing any of the plot past that point, okay? So if you are the type who wants to discover the next movie Messiah without getting spoiled by some asshole, you're fine. There will be no spoilers in this video. Likewise, if you have only read the first book and not the second one, you're fine. It's only going to be spoilers for this story, but this story will get spoiled in its entirety. Now that we're finally on the same page, we can get started for something that is going to be probably one of the longest videos on my channel. So find a comfy seat for yourself, grab yourself a nice drink and let's talk dune and philosophy but before presenting the summary of this video to you guys if you want to support my work you can do so by clicking the first link in the description it's my coffee page you can pledge or donate since this is the start of the video i understand that you don't know quite yet if i am worthy of your support what i encourage you to do is Keep the link open, watch the video, and if at the end you like the video and you want to thank me for the content, then you can support me at this point. All right, with this out of the way, let's talk summary. So this video is actually going to be cut into two parts because as I wrote the script, I realized that if I made it in one shot, it would be seven hours long and ain't nobody got time for that. Even for me, it's way too much work at once for editing, for example. So. I have separated in part two and part, uh, part one and part two. This is part one that you're watching right now. And in part one, we're going to talk about Machiavellianism, politics, Marxism, postmodernism, and religion. Five big topics as you will see. Part two will concern itself with ecology, Nietzscheanism, Jungian analysis, existentialism, transhumanism, and feminism. So that will be for those of you that will be catching part two. But as for today, we are going to concern ourselves with, with these five big philosophies, starting with the philosophy of Niccolo Machiavelli, the author of The Prince, who advocated that rulers should act ethically only when it serves their goal and that promises and laws should be broken when necessary. So 
so the pursuit of power justifies everything, right? As long as it is aligned with your goals, any type of morality or ethics are completely irrelevant. And this method of approaching the world has led to the term Machiavellianism, which in modern psychology is part of the dark triad of personality traits that refers to a person who is manipulative and for whom the end justifies the means. If you know about the dark triad, you know that the other two traits are, I think, psychopathy and sociopathy, if I'm not mistaken. So the fact that Machiavellianism is part of that triad, that triangle, says a lot about what we, modern human, perceive this trait to be. We perceive it as a negative trait. And yet, the vast majority of our politicians, the vast majority of our CEOs, showcase traits of Machiavellianism. Why? Because it's a net advantage when your goal is to make it, when your goal is to become successful. And since the story of Dune is first and foremost a story about power struggles between great houses, unsurprisingly, the majority of the cast members, the majority of the big players of the universe are also Machiavellian in nature, simply because it's survival of the fittest. If you cannot if you do not possess the ability to plan and to scheme, you simply cannot make it in this universe. It really is just an effort to present you two camps, to present you two methods of getting things done. And these two camps can best be represented by the fox on one hand and the lion on the other hand. And in this case, these are also Machiavellian notions and concepts that Machiavelli dis discusses in his political treaties where he explains that for a politician to be successful, he needs to have both. He cannot just be a fox or just be a lion because that makes him incomplete. He needs both the strength and the cunningness because both traits possesses their weaknesses and their strengths. So the fox, for example, is very adept at recognizing traps, but he is fairly useless when it comes to defending himself against brute force. And the lion is the opposite. The lion is defen defenseless against traps because he lacks the slyness, but he is exactly what you need to frighten off the wolves. And if we are to look at the story of Dune, naturally you understand that the lion in this case is Duke Leto and the fox is Baron Arkonen. And they both have the strengths of their weaknesses and vice versa. So the biggest weakness of the Baron is complete and absolute brute force. So it would be the Atreides in a fair fight or the Sardaukar. This is why the Baron is so afraid of the Imperial forces because he knows that he cannot match them. And Duke Leto's weakness is traps because times and times again, he falls into traps. And so what I want to do now is to look at the character traits that both of these archetypes possess and the way they're described by the author. So the Baron, for example, is painted as jealous and he is one who is surprised by truth without fear. I think that's a very interesting sentence. This means that the Baron, when he is facing his subordinates, is always taken aback when they can announce to him bad news without fearing him, his reaction. It means that he constantly needs everyone around him to be afraid because that is how he can maintain his reign. And this also connects with his ability to use fear to make sure that everyone around him understands the consequences of displeasing him, disobeying him, or just failing entirely. When he goes out of his way to kill someone from his house or to kill members or just even an entire other house, he always makes sure that this is used as a mean to warn his other enemies of his capabilities. He is perfectly aware of the value of spectacle in warfare, which leads us to our first quote of the day. The Duke must know when I encompass his doom, the Baron said, and the other great houses must learn of it. The knowledge will give them pause. I'll gain a bit more room to maneuver. The necessity is obvious, and I don't have to like it. Very telling. The Baron is not a sadist. He doesn't really enjoy killing people, but he understands that this is the way to get things done politically. And so when he kills people, he makes sure that it is as brutal and as visible as possible. He turns it into a, glor into a glorious and a gory spectacle. And it, as I said, is not just something that he does to his enemies. 
he also does them does it to his own troops. So if he has someone in his entourage who is useless, he just gets rid of them because as long as someone outlives their usefulness, he sees no point in their existence. But when he does get rid of these people, he always makes sure that this death doesn't go to waste. He treats people as expendable, yes, but also as valuable resources, which is something that is only really possible if you have the ability to read people on an emotional level, which the Baron is quite adept at. He's an excellent judge of men. He can automatically, when looking at one of his pers personnel, know what this person's weaknesses are and what their fear are. He has a keen eye for darkness. As he says to his mentor, Peter, your pleasures are what tie you to me. So is, he is intimately aware of the reason why his men follow him. He's not fooled by the act. He knows that they don't like him and he's fine with that because as long as they obey, as long as they fulfill their duty, then that is all he really cares about. And this is what makes him fearful. This is what makes him dangerous. It's this ability. I think this is an ability that comes directly from the fact that the Baron himself is full of fear and full of weakness and full of darkness. I found that if you are aware of the darkness in you, especially if you possess it in kind, then reading it in other people becomes much easier. Good people tend to have a tendency to not be able to recognize darkness around them, which was Ducleto's biggest weakness. He has, he has not enough darkness in him. Poe, in that sense, is much more complete. Poe has much more darkness thanks to his mother. This entire nebulous of darkness that surrounds the Baron is also quite present in the way the story describes him. Because when he is, for example, compared to an animal, he is either compared to a spider or an octopus, which don't tend to be animals that people find quite cute and who also have this symbolic reputation for manipulation, right? The multiple limbs, the ability to encircle the ability to, to, to create a net, to catch your prey, to catch bugs. That is what makes the spider so fearful. And then there's also a more <sighs> problematic, uh, I would say, comparison to be made here. I'm certain that you, you're, uh, you're familiar with these caricatures of uh, the big figure surrounding the globe of the earth with a hat and uh, the arms of the octopus, as in to say this person or, or this group of people control the planet from the shadows. Well, there is quite literally a scene in Dune where the Baron is above a globe of Arrakis and he's described as a big octopus coming from outside of the shadows. His tentacles enveloping the planet as if to say, this is mine, this is mine to use, this is mine to exploit, this is mine to profit from. This is what the Baron is about. He rolls through deceit and manipulation from the shadows. Why? Because he's physically incapable of doing it via strength. That is made clear by his physical appearance. The story loves telling us that the Baron is fat because he's like 400 pounds and he has to use suspenders to be able to move. He is so physically inept that if he was left to his own device, he couldn't even walk. That, I think, is the best way the story can tell us that we are dealing with someone who has to rely on cunningness and manipulation because he has no other choice. And I think that the fact that the story of Dune, the book at least, opens with the Baron as the first big political player to be presented isn't innocent. It's in a way to set the tone for the rest of the series, which leads us to quote number two. The learning of the wise the justice of the great, the prayers of the righteous, and the valor of the brave. All of these are nothing without a ruler who knows the art of ruling. Make that the science of your tradition. AKA, you can be very brave and you can be very loyal and very strong, but if you don't have the ability to rule in the Machiavellian sense, then all of that will be for nothing. If anything, all of that will become a weakness, which is, again, the sign that Dune, the story, isn't a moralist. It's not a story that tells you morality is useless. Instead, it's the story that tells you that morality is a tool, morality is a weapon, it exists past morality. Machiavellian ways are not good or bad. They are either efficient or not efficient. And if they are efficient, then they are to be used if your goal is to access power. 
which doesn't mean that the Baron's way is the only one, okay? It doesn't mean that you have to become a fat manipulator from the shadows. It just means that you have to have at least a certain degree of understanding of what being Machiavellian means, because if you don't, other people will tell you. And so I said that the Duke was more akin to the lion, but this doesn't mean that the Duke is a complete idiot. The Duke just follows a different type of Machiavellianism, leading to quote number three. She said a ruler must learn to persuade and not to compel. She said he must lay the best coffee of to attract the finest men. And I think that describes the Duke pretty well. The Duke doesn't rule by fear. The Duke rules, rules through admiration. He is such a good example of a man that men flock to his castle. They flock to his doors because they cannot wait to serve him. They cannot wait to die for him in battle. And that too is an ability that is extremely powerful as we see with Paul later down the line because he also is an Atreides and he also possesses that ability. Now, let's talk about the archetype of the lion and the way it is described in the story of Dune, because we see that the fox is not described positively at all, and the lion is the exact opposite. When you look at the, the duke and every member of the Atreides house, uh, say for Awat, they're all described as very tall, with a thin face, with sharp angles, atop a narrow waist. So, they are essentially built like superheroes, which is the exact opposite of the Baron, who is built like a balloon. In French, we have something that we call le physique de ses idées. It's, it's a notion that uh, people's body reflect the content of their brains and the content of their ideology. And I think that this applies perfectly here. On one hand, you have the obese Baron, who is a manipulator, and on the other hand, you have the fit athletic duke, who is a go-getter and who is the type of person to get things done with his own two hands. He also is described times and times again as having a stoic demeanor, so he refuses to show his emotions and his fatigue, always to make sure that his men don't get discouraged. If you look at the Baron, the Baron is the exact opposite. When the Baron is mad, he shows it. When he's hungry, he cannot stop his hunger. He has to ask for food right now. He has no self-control, he is a slave to instantaneous gratification. It also is said that the Duke is a fine strategist who perfectly understands that sometimes one has no choice but to run into a trap. And this is to balance out the notion that he might just be a, a brainless brute who fell for the Baron's trap because he's an idiot. The Duke knew the second he stepped foot on Arrakis that this was a trap. He's not stupid. He saw the signs, but he also understood that he had no choice. He couldn't refuse. He couldn't say to the Emperor, no, I don't want the planet that would make my house immensely rich, because that would make him look like a weakling to the other houses. So it was, it was, a, it was quite a small trap that the Baron, the, uh, the Imperium laid for our dear Duke. But the Duke himself and the political system that surrounds him, for that very same reason, are the exact opposite of the Baron or the Emperor, the Padisha's Emperor. He bases everything off of loyalty. So the men that follow him are loyal to him because he is him. It's not because they can gain something from him or it's not because they fear him. They respect him without the fear. And you see that also with the nicknames that are utilized for the men that follow him. So Duncan is nicknamed the Moral. And Gurney is nicknamed the Valorous. Clearly, the story tries to have you side with the Atreides. I don't know a single person who read Dune and said, Oh, fuck yeah, I love the Arconnen. I wish I was House Harkonnen. No, they are clearly depicted as the villains. But this doesn't mean that the ones that the story wants you to like are going to be victorious. I think this is what I was trying to get at. The story is not a story about good guys who are going to be victorious because they're good and they're kind, and bad guys who are going to be defeated because they're bad. That makes no sense. It's not how real life works. And since Dune, even though it's a science fiction story, is highly realistic, at least in terms of its politics, it also could be described as an anti-fairy tale. A fairy tale is exactly that. Good guys win because they're good. But that's not real, right? Most often in the realm of politics, good guys preferentially lose. Why? Because, again, they, they lack that darkness. They're too easy to manipulate. And so the fact that this perfect duke with his perfect man lost at the hands of the gross and obese baron is part for the cause, and it was to be expected. 
which is also another punch in the gut for all of the Atreides fanboys. Because this means that all of these great qualities that make the Atreides so appealing to the reader can also be described as non-qualities because they're the reasons why they lost. And this is another trait of Machiavellianism that needs to be mentioned and part of the past morality arc of the entire philosophy. It's the fact that Machiavelli asks you the following question. If you have a quality, but this quality in the realm of politics leads you to lose, is it still a quality? And the rabbit hole goes down deep because once you understand this, you also understand why the majority of modern politicians are pieces of shit. They're pieces of shit because they have been preferentially selected through these traits. Foxes make it in the realm of politics. They survive and lines get taken over. They, can, they get destroyed. So if you look at the top of the political pyramid and you see that the majority of people are liars, sociopaths or Machiavellian, that is normal. It's because the political system is designed to only allow these qualities to rise to the top. And the proof of that in Dune is the poor Dr. Yue. Dr. Yue betrays, betrays the Atreides despite the fact that he loves them. He loves their qualities, but that doesn't stop him from going out of his way to destroy their empire. Why? Because love is not a measure of success in the realm of politics. And neither is fear. Once again, it's not about love being good or bad or fear being good or bad. It's about how efficient they are. And what makes something efficient in the Machiavellian sense is how much control it allows you to gain over people. If you can gain control over your people via love, then love is good. If you lose that control, then it's bad. And the same goes for fear. So as long as that control is maintained, then all is fair in love and war. And we'll see that this is also one of the lessons of Dune. Both of the characters of the Duke and the Baron had political systems that relied on completely different uh, values and, and essences. And it was working until they lost control of the very tool that they used to maintain their hegemony and to maintain their power. But it's not one of the only difference between these two characters. One that I would like to mention that is not uh, evident to people who haven't read the book in detail is the fact that the Duke and the Baron have, have different ancestries. So Leto is actually a royal cousin of the Emperor. So he has royal blood. But the Baron has no royal blood. The Arconan line from the Baron's side has gotten its title strictly due to wealth. And this is interesting because it means that Leto is aristocracy while Baron Vladimir is only quote-unquote bourgeoisie. And one became a lion and the other one became a fox. If we are to look at the genealogy of morals, this makes sense. How was aristocracy addicted and how did it gain power? It gained power via strength. So preferentially, the people who are part of the aristocracy were passed down that strength and became lions. But the bourgeoisie didn't gain their power via strength. They gained their power via cunningness and the ability to make it on the free market. So their ancestors naturally also inherited these qualities and they preferentially became foxes. Down the line, we see that with these two characters, this perfectly explains their differences of value and methods. It also explains why the Baron wins, because between the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie, the ones that in the modern world are ruling this planet right now speaking is not the aristocracy. The aristocracy is dead. The ones that have all the power in their hands nowadays is the bourgeoisie. And this difference is also demonstrated in the nature of the feud. You might wonder why the Arconans hate the Atreides so much and vice versa. That is because they had a clash in the distant past where one Arconan ancestor got banished for cowardice by an Atreides ancestor because that Arconan fled the battlefield. I think it was the Battle of Corinth, something like this. And this, this feud started from this and just got worse and worse and worse. The Arconan never really forgave the Atreides for that punishment. And the Atreides always looked down on the Arconan from that point on thinking, okay, these are cowards. These are not people of royal blood. They did not gain their status as a great house via their strength of arm. They got it because they are very good at making money. And House Atreides doesn't respect that at all. And this is a weakness because this means that the Duke has a morality. 
And when you have a clearly defined morality, you also have a clearly defined set of values that dictate the way you do things. Because if you know that someone is a lion, a lion behaves like a lion. He is highly predictable. And this is the reason why the method that the Arconan used to fragilize his mask and to make him falter, to make him more susceptible to the plot, was to go after his wife. They went after the person that they know he loves most because this was enough to just completely get his brain and mind off of the fact that Yue was the actual traitor. If you reverse the situation, try to do that to the Baron. Who are you going to target in his entourage that would fragilize him enough to make the type of mistake? The guy loves no one. So even though as a human, that's a trait that makes him despicable, as a leader, it is actually something that makes him unpredictable and very hard to assault. So we see that being devoid of emotion, at least in the Machiavellian sense, seems to be a positive trait. And I think that this is something that the Duke also remarks when he says, I am tired, the Duke agreed. I am morally tired. The melancholy degeneration of the great houses has afflicted me at last. And we were such strong people once. So the constant emotional warfare, the constant manipulation that is inherent to the realm and the world of politics is wearing him down. Meanwhile, someone like the Baron seems to enjoy it. Someone like the Emperor himself, they seem to enjoy it. They seem to feed off of it. It's as if you had extroverts and introverts, right? You have those that are emboldened and that are energized by plotting. And you, then you have those who would rather just have a word of honesty where people are straightforward, but like the Duke who are forced to engage in these little schemes and that just doesn't align with their nature, so it just eats them from the inside. But there's another thing from this passage you might have noticed that I want to stop, stop on for a second, and that is the topic of aristocracy. Because as we explained, the Duke is from a line of aristocrats, he has royal blood. So this also means that at some point or the other, one of his ancestors gained that title via the strength of his arm. But that strength also has a tendency to weaken with each generation because there comes a point where aristocracy is so powerful and well installed that it no longer needs to fight for its survival. And it's exactly what we saw in Europe, at least in France, where the descendants of the aristocrats looked nothing like their ancestors. They were much weaker, they were not adept in combat, and they were also moral degenerates. There were people who were into hedonism, there were people who had given up on the old ways because the old ways were no longer needed. So instead, they turned towards comfort. And the same thing happened to the Atreides. Because if you compare Leto to his grandpa, or even to his dad, these men were described as, as almost machines, as statues. They were described as having no emotions, as taking decisions for the good of the empire, even if it meant sacrificing people. And their son was not like this. Their son didn't have that, that coldness of the heart that was needed. So the idea here is that by its nature, aristocracy is doomed for death because the rule of the best is eventually the rule of the son of the best and the grandson of the best. And these qualities of the best are not necessarily passed down upon generation after generation. So at some point you have an aristocracy that is no longer the best. And because it's no longer the best, it is now simply an oligarchy, an oligarchy that is now entirely unfair because these people don't deserve to rule. But most importantly, these people don't have the strength or the qualities to rule. So when someone comes like the bourgeoisie to actually threaten their throne, they are completely defenseless, and the entire system collapses. But that connects again to the notion that things are not good or bad. They are only useful or not useful, and something that used to be useful, good, can degenerate into something not useful or dangerous, which then turns it bad. So, we for example can look at the loyalty that the Atreides tend to inspire in the hearts of their followers. That is good, because it allows for more control. But that loyalty can also lead to fanaticism. And when that is the case, then it becomes bad. Which leads to quote number seven. To hold Arrakis, the Duke said, one is faced with decisions that may cost one his self-respect. He pointed out the window to the Atreides green and black banner hanging limply from a staff at the edge of the landing field. That honorable banner could come to mean many evil things. 
Paul swallowed in a dry throat. His father's words carried futility, a sense of fatalism that left the boy with an empty feeling in his chest. Power and fear, he said, the tools of statecraft. That film clip there, they call you Mahdi, Lizan al -Gaib. As a last resort, you might capitalize on that. So that's a nice little foreshadowing for what happens later on in the story that we will, of course, discuss in the part about religion. But for now, let's get back to the characteristics that define the lion and the fox. Because as we saw, Leto and the Atreides in general are described as lions. They're lean, they're good looking. And on the flip side, the Arconan are described as fat and gross. Which, by the way, fun fact, the adjective that is used the most often in Dune, in Dune Part 1 is gross. And it's only used to describe one person, and that is the Baron. If you read the book, pay attention. Every time the guy appears, at some point or the other, he is described as being gross. And this is not innocent. I don't think that this is something that the author just did because he found it fun. It's because the story insists on the fact that he is a despicable person, even physically, and that tells us a lot about the way he thinks and the way he runs his political system. But it doesn't stop there. Right? The story of Dune doesn't just have a, f a bone to pick with fat people. It also has a big problem with effeminacy. So, for example, another member of the Arconan entourage is Peter de Vries, who is a Montat. And Peter is described as tall, though slender, with something about him suggesting effeminacy. And it doesn't stop at femininity. It's also the fact that These people, like Peter, who are described as more feminine, also tend to be sadistic, and they also are perverts. So, Peter kills for pleasure, that is established. He is not someone who kills for the greater good, or who kills because he has a plan. He just enjoys making people suffer. And then, we have the Baron. And if you read the book, you already know what I'm going to tell you here, because the Baron is described times and times again as being a rapist who enjoys having his way with young boys. And I say young boys to not say something else. And this too is a trait that the story really insists on, which is why I don't think I'm reading too much into it when I say that it matters. The fact that times and times again the story reminds us that the Baron is an homosexual who likes little boys matters. At some point of the story, the Baron wakes up and the, the, the narration tells us that the first thing he looks at in his bedroom is a statue of a naked boy. Why are you sharing this detail with me? Well, it's because I believe it is relevant. Just like with effeminacy, the story is telling us that the Baron is a bad person in part because he is an homosexual. Homosexuality in him is a dead giveaway. It's a sign that his personality, his entire being, is perverted. So that's one interpretation that I have. The other interpretation I have is that the author made the Baron an homosexual because it's a way to show that he's not a proper man. He is incapable of having offsprings. He's incapable of reproducing or having people that are going to be able to take over. We know that the Baron has had a kid, right? It's Jessica, but it's not a legal child. It's not a child that can then inherit his empire. So in a sense, he is impotent, right? It is said and it is known that his line is going to die with him because the person that is going to take over after him is his nephew, it's not his kid. And that connects back to the idea of bourgeoisie and aristocracy. The aristocracy perpetuates itself by giving the power down to the son. The bourgeoisie doesn't work like this. The bourgeoisie, you might just pass down your fortune to, like, your apprentice. The idea of bloodline is not really present there. So this is the notion that the baron is incapable of getting things done with his own two hands, right? He is too cowardly to have blood on his hands because he never, in the entirety of the story, actually, I think, goes out of his way to kill anyone. Actually, the only person that he kills is a slave boy that he raped. I think that's saying a lot. The movie did something I didn't quite like. They had the Baron kill Duke Leto. Not Duke Leto, sorry, Yue. In the book, the Baron doesn't do that. He would never do that. He would never get his own hands dirty. And that naturally also coincides with his method of ruling because he constantly has to rely on his grunts. He relies on the people around him. But here is the interesting part. 
the people that surround the Baron that take his orders, you would think would be capable because they're supposed to pour his weight, quite literally, but they're not. They're complete idiots. So this is part of what I was talking about with homosexuality and effeminacy. All of this is a way to paint the Baron as a cowardly man. And because he is a cowardly man, he can only roar over a sea of cowards, of half-wits. Because them being disposable also means that the Baron doesn't have to trust them. He can get rid of them because none of them is actually of value to him. Leading to quote number eight. Pity should be cruel, he noted. Failure was, by definition, expendable. The whole universe sat there, open to the man who could make the right decision. The uncertain rabbits had to be exposed, made to run for their burrows. Else how could you control them and breed them? He pictured his fighting men as bees, rooting, routing the rabbits. And he thought, the day hums sweetly when you have enough bees to work for you. So the Baron likes to surround himself with people who have low agency because that way he can always stay in control since these people are very easy to manipulate. And this is why you will also have noticed that every single member of his close entourage or of his lieutenants tend to have vices that he can control them through. So if he cannot use fear to make you do his biting, he will use pleasure. And I think that's another quote that goes, the Baron shifted his attention to the guard captain Human Kuru, Caesar's line of jaw muscles, chin like a boot toe. A man to be trusted because the captain's vices were known. So the Baron will always, we only trust people that he knows he can manipulate through drugs, for example. He knows that if he becomes your drug lord, you will stay loyal to him, not because you like him, but because without your drugs, you are going to be miserable. And so you depend on him. And that is another degenerate trait. It, there's a reason why drug addicts surround the Baron and why he himself is addicted to a much more evil and much more degenerate uh, method of acquiring pleasure. It's because it's another way for the author to paint them as malevolent. But beyond the moral aspect, it's the civilizational impact of such a method that I think is very interesting to discuss. Because by dumbing down his citizens through fear and drugs, the Baron essentially establishes a form of absolute authoritarian state where everyone obeys him like a queen bee because they lack the ability to not do that. And eventually, as Machiavelli points out, this is bound to degenerate because soon enough, it's not that the people will obey him because they're afraid or because they depend on him for drugs. It will be because they no longer are able to make their own decisions. So you will face a society of people who are so inept that they eventually become their greatest threat to the survival of civilization. They will no longer be competent enough to serve as bootlickers, to serve as foot soldiers, which will be the Baron's doing. It is because the Baron is such a control freak that he has turned the people that are supposed to work for him and to his biting into individuals that soon enough will no longer be able to do that. And if we want to push the analogy into the realm of religious symbolism, there is a very interesting part of the story where the Baron is described and compared to the beast of the book of Revelation. I need to read you that passage because it's so interesting. I think it was page 231. Leto suddenly recalled a thing Gurney Alec had said once, seeing a picture of the Baron. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. This beast has been interpreted as the demonic and powerful authority of the state. So the Baron in himself, in his presence, represents the, the image, the symbolic image of authoritarianism. A form of authoritarianism that, just like in the book of Revelation, turns the people that follow the beast into sheep, who are marked with the number of the beast and who become creatures of the beast. And let's just continue with the interpretation because I think it's so interesting. If you have read the book of Revelation, you know that the beast's authority doesn't come from itself. It is given, it's bestowed upon it by the dragon. 
It is the dragon that stands on the earth that beacons the beast out of the water and then gives it authority over the people of the earth. And if we are to look at the story of Dune, I think that the dragon is an analogy for the Padisha Emperor. It's the Padisha Emperor who gave the Baron the necessary power in order to defeat Ducleto and take over the uh, Arrakis Empire. And again, in the Book of Revelation, the dragon is opposed to a woman that is clothed with the sun and her son. And I think we know who these people are. These people are Jessica and they are Paul. Paul, who unsurprisingly is the exact opposite of the Baron, because as an Atreides, he is described as having a sure hand with his people. So he is naturally trusted by his men. He doesn't have to rely on drug or fear. He can just be his own person and that is enough. And that is because he possesses the innate ability to always say what people want to hear. Not because he's cunning like the Baron, not because he can read people emotionally, but because he truly aligns with people's desire. Leading to quote number nine, page 284. Kynes met Paul Stair and presently said, No Arconan ever admitted error. Perhaps you are not like them, Atreides. It could be a fault in their education, Paul said. You say you are not for sale, but I believe I have the coin you'll accept. For your loyalty, I offer my loyalty to you. Totally. My son has the Atreides sincerity, Jessica thought. He has that tremendous, almost naive honor. And what a powerful force that truly is. She saw that Paul's words had shaken Kynes. This is nonsense, Kynes said. You're just a boy, and I'm the Duke, Paul said. I'm an Atreides. No Atreides has ever broken such a bond. Kind swallowed. When I say totally, Paul said, I mean without reservation. I would give my life for you. Sire, Kind said, and the wood was torn from him. But Jessica saw that he was not now speaking to a boy of 15, but to a man, to a superior. Now Kind's meant the wood. In this moment, He'd give his life for Paul, she thought. How did the Atreides accomplish this thing so quickly, so easily? And that connects back to what I was saying. That this weakness of Leto and of Paul is also a strength when used properly. The reason why the Baron doesn't want competent individuals around him is because he's afraid that they would overtake him. Because if you have capable lieutenants like Leto, what if one day they decide that they want to be Duke in the place of the Duke? They are going to replace you if they are better than you. So, instead of becoming a better man, the Baron surrounds himself with weaker individuals, with, which proves that he is aware of his own limited abilities. And that is even something that he says himself at some point in the story when he tells his lieutenant, Let us never deceive ourselves, nephew. The truth is a powerful weapon. We know how we overwhelm the Atreides, Awat knows it too. We did it with wealth. So it's quite interesting that someone like the Baron would lack self-esteem so much that he would readily admit that his empire is an empire of weaklings who have risen to, to these great heights because of their tremendous wealth, which in a sense is also a strength. Being self-aware is a strength in the Machiavellian sense. But there are other parts of the Baron's personality that he's not in control of, that he's not self-aware about. So for example, he has a tendency to hold a grudge. And we see that with the fact that he destroyed the Atreides for a grudge that was centuries old. Whereas if he was a strong man, if he was a secure man, he could just ignore it. The secure man can disregard grudges because usually when you hold on to grudges it's because you are still afraid that the person who begrudged you might come back to finish the job. And this is the Baron's fear. He's afraid of everyone and everything because he is weak. He is not able to sleep peacefully at night, which is also caused by the fact that the members of his own family, times and times again, try to murder him, which is a trait that he shares with the Emperor. Right? The, the Emperor and the Baron has very, are very, very similar. The only difference is that the Baron has the, 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 the Emperor has the Sardaukar. So he has extra power on Vladimir Arkonen. But in terms of personality, 
it's said in the story at some point that the emperor keeps the Sardoka as dumb as possible. And he makes sure that they never receive any, any political training because he knows that if they did, then they would maybe start to question their loyalty to him and they would start to have political ambitions that would make them dangerous. So he makes them as physically capable as possible on the battlefield and then he keeps them as dumb as possible. But at least the emperor is somewhat respected by the people of his following, the people around him, because he has an aura, right? He still has that, like... He still has that, that aura of authority and power. The Baron has none of it. The Baron has so little of it, actually, that the own member of his family and bloodline call him the old monster or the old damnable man, which shows that his entire empire is dysfunctional. Because at the, at the core of an empire is the family unit. It's the family or the, the core group of members that control the empire that then color the empire and give it its nature. The fact that the Baron has a family of degenerates and people who hate him also explains why the empire that surrounds him, surrounds it, the Arkham Empire, is degenerate as well. And this connects to what I said previously about homosexuality and effeminacy. It's the notion that if you have a weak ruler, then the nation itself will be weak. So, for example, at some point, it is revealed that the Fremen were able to beat the Sardaukar. But the Baron is not willing to see that, even though it is logical and there is proof. Because to accept this would be to accept that the, F the Fremen are valuable, and in his brain, they're just rabble. He hates them, they're scum. So instead, he concocts, concocts this scenario where the Atreides disguise themselves as Fremen to beat the Sardaukar. Why would they do that? No one knows. But since this is something that the Baron would do, I think in this case, he's just projecting the way he would act onto a people that he should know would never act like this. And this is why he's so reliant on Mentats. When Peter de Vries dies, he is Mentatless and he's also helpless. This is why he's in such a hurry to get to Fir Awat, because a Mentat possesses the logical thinking skills that he doesn't get, which if we connect it back to the notion of effeminacy or queerness, might be another nail in the coffin of the stereotype because it is also something that you hear a lot. Women like logical thinking skills. Queer people like logical thinking skills. They rely entirely on emotion. They are emotional creatures. But that is not an indictment. You know, Machiavelli in The Prince never tells people that to be a good ruler, you have to be an alpha chad and super masculine. This is only true if it serves your purpose. And we know that the Baron was able to climb through the ranks with none of these qualities, which also show that they're not necessarily needed. What is needed, as I said previously, is to keep control of your instrument of power. And both the Baron's mistake and Leto's mistake was that. They lost control of it. And this is why I said that the Baron lacked self-awareness in a sense, because he should have seen that coming. He should have been able to perceive that there was a problem with the way he was running things. But because he is not noble blood, the little that he was able to build, this great house, is so precious to him that he is unwilling to reconsider because if he lets go of that, then he has nothing else. In that sense, he was entirely delusional. And if there is one trait that Machiavelli insists is the downfall of a leader, it's this. It's the inability to see reality for what it is. Because once you lose sight of why you use your instrument of power, then you also lose the use of that instrument. And when that happens to the Baron, he is stripped from everything because without power, the Baron is nothing. As Alia describes him, the Baron is a frightened old man, too weak and fat to support his own flesh without his suspensors. Which is another lesson that Machiavelli teaches us that what makes a leader powerful is the fact that people follow him. It is the people that give him power. Without this, the leader is literally just a man. And so once you understand this as a leader, you better hold on to the instruments that allow you to control the people that give you your power. Because once you lose it, you are literally nothing. Now, I have an interesting bit of lore to conclude this segment about Machiavellianism. If you have read Dune, you know that in the story, the person that kills the Baron is Alia. It's not Poe. In the movie, they made it Poe because Alia is not in the movie. And she kills him with the gum jabbar. 
Now, if you remember, the Gomja bar is used to sift and test between beasts and humans. And if you pass the test, you are a human. So the fact that he was killed with that instrument is very revealing. Because throughout the story, the Arkonen are called Arkonen beasts. They are described as not human. They are monsters. And indeed, the beast of the beast, the leader of the Arkonen himself, had a beast's death. He was killed just like an animal. But the Baron is not the only one who receives an unceremonious death, because Leto's death is also quite gruesome. And I think ultimately that this is also a lesson. It's a way to say that politicians are just men, because once they are dead, in death, they die just like the rest of us. And it's not limited to death. Even in life, once you see past the aura of authority, you realize that what you are dealing with were just men who ultimately were fighting with one another in a struggle for power. That is what constitutes the realm of politics, which is the perfect transition to move on to part two of this video that is going to concern itself with this specific topic. Now that we're done talking about the main players of Dune and our respective philosophy, we can start to discuss the politics of their universe, which are extremely complex. It's what makes the charm of Dune. The universe of Dune is ruled by an imperium with at its head the Emperor. And the Emperor is being kept in check by the great houses that technically swore allegiance to him, but we know better. We know that they don't really have a choice. It's just a political scheming to keep the balance, to make sure that the entire realm doesn't just collapse into chaos. And all of these great houses are united under the Landsrad, which is a form of a European Union, or if we want to compare it to something like l'ONU, where all of the nations of the world come together in order to make peace. Naturally, we know that it is more complicated than that. And all of these nations have to obey the same set of law to preserve the peace. And that set of law in the world of Dune is called the Great Convention. All of this stems from a past where atomics and the use of machines to kill humans was rampant. And to preserve the human race from extinction at some point, all of these great tribes, all of these great empires had to come together to put an end to the war. So that is the origin of the, this political system, a political system that resembles our own. It's the same for us. The reason why nowadays we're all hand in hand and we're trying to make peace is because back in the days we used to wage war. It's World War I and World War II that made people realize that if there is a World War III, most likely there will be no humanity left. So we're trying to uh, prevent it the best we can, just like they are. But it's not the only factors to be taken into account. Because there are also other players that exist outside of this, this duo of the Imperium and the Great Houses. You also have the Guild, and the Guild has a monopoly on space travel, which in the universe of Dune, that is planetary, is extremely important. And you also have the Bene Gesserit, and that leads us to another quote directly from the book. <clears throat> Politics indeed. The original Bene Gesserit school was directed by Dews, who saw the need of a thread of continuity in human affairs. They saw there could be no such continuity without separating human stock from animal stock for breeding purposes. So the Bene Gesserit, it's a, it's a complex order, but their role is essentially to walk from the shadows, to manipulate the, the bloodlines of each house, to make sure that this one marries this one and it creates an offspring that can sort of mesh the two houses together, which at face value looks to be strictly for the sake of peace, but we know better. They have their own objective. It's plan within a plan within a plan. That is the world of politics in Dune. And in this world, stability is essential because as I said, if the system collapses, then war starts and chaos erupts. Here is a quote directly from the Bene Gesserit school. In politics, the tripod is the most unstable of all structures. Why? Because if there are three legs, the imbalance of just one leg is going to make the entire structure collapse. And so, since we saw that we have the Imperium, and we have the Great Houses and the Guild, 
plus the Bene Gesserit on the side, this entire political system is unstable from the beginning, right? It was, it was designed to collapse. The reason why it is being kept in check so far is because the emperor has all the power. So it's not really an equal, an equal deal that we're dealing with here. It's just that the great houses don't really have a choice. They have to obey the big boss. But if something happens to strip the big boss of his power, then everything is going to collapse. And the destruction of House Atreides was actually put into place to prevent this from happening because the Emperor was afraid that Leto was going to unite the Great Houses because of his charisma and his ability as a leader of men. And so he had to go out of his way to remove him. But he couldn't do it outright because if he did it outright, he would reveal his cards and then the Great Houses would also unite and destroy him, which is why it had to be done through treason. This is key to understand because what the destruction of House Atreides was also about is wealth. Because Arrakis is that, it represents wealth in the Wood of Dune. Which is why, as I explained in the previous part, Leto couldn't just say no. He had to take the chance because it was too good to pass. Whoever rules Arrakis earns what is known as a Shoam Directorship meaning that they can get a large chunk of the profits that come from the commerce of spice. And any house that has a Shoam directorship is immediately catapulted at the top of the Landsrad. They gain a lot of voting power. This is, as I said, an important detail because this means that in the world of Dune, just like our own, the true driver of politics is profit and nothing else. It is profit that drives the world. It is profit that fills the pockets of your politicians that influence their vote. This is how the world works. And since the emperor has most of the power, naturally we also understand that he must have most of the profit. And it's the case. The story tells us that the Padisha emperor owns 59.65% of the Shoam directorship, meaning he has a majority. So his vote is more powerful than the vote of everyone else, meaning that technically the Imperium controls the universe. Another quote, page 55. Few products escape the Shoam touch, the Duke said. And now we control it, said Paul? To a certain degree. But the important thing is to consider all the houses that depend on Shoam profits. And to think of the enormous proportion of those profits dependent upon a single product, the spice. Imagine what would happen if something should reduce spice production. Whoever had stockpiled melange could make a killing, Paul said. Others will be out in the cold. The Duke permitted himself a moment of grim satisfaction. Looking at his son and thinking how penetrating, how truly educated that observation had been, he nodded. The Arconans have been stockpiling for more than 20 years. They mean spice production to fail, and you to be blamed. They wish the Atreides' name to become unpopular, the Duke said. Think of the Landstride houses that look to me for a certain amount of leadership. They are unofficial spokesmen. Think how they'd react if I were responsible for a serious reduction in their income. After all, one's own profits come first. The great convention be damned. You can't let someone pauperize you. A harsh smile twisted the Duke's mouth. Dead look the other way no matter what was done to me. So, once again, to prove that Leto perfectly understands politics. He knows that all of these great houses that fanboy after him and call him great leader are in reality lying through their fucking teeth. Because if they have to choose between their loyalty to the Duke or profit, they will pick profit because this is what power is. So the real question is not who is going to win the war, it's who is going to be able to maintain control of Arrakis, because whoever manages that wins the war by default. But this doesn't mean that wealth is the only lever of power in the world of politics. There is also naturally another lever, a lever that in the case of a war is essential, because if you don't have it, you can participate, and that is military power. And in this too, the Emperor reigns supreme. He has both Monopoly of a Shram Directorship and Salusa Secundus, his planet prison that he has specifically engineered to turn criminals into military members, and not just any military members. 
his planet prison creates the fiercest military corps in the galaxy, the Imperial Sardaukar. If your goal is to overthrow the Emperor, you have to break both levers. You have to take the spice away from him, you have to take Shoam away from him, and you also have to find a way to either kill off the Sardaukar, which is a tall task, or take his prison planet away, because that is what allows him to produce these members. But if it were as simple as just crushing the Emperor head on, then the Great Houses would have attempted it already. It's not just that the Emperor has overwhelming power and control over wealth, it's also that he is extremely sly. We discussed that previously with Machiavellianism. And this is also what dictates who makes it in the world of politics. We won't go back into it, but there is a factor, an aspect of it, that I think is interesting that we just saw in the quote I shared with you. It's the fact that all of this that the Duke Leto explained, all of the scheming, all of the, the, the plotting around the control of Schwam directorship, none of this is out in the open. All of that is double speak. And another great example I have is page 99, where it said that our sublime Padisha Emperor has charged me to take possession of this planet and end all dispute. The ritualistic formality of it touched him with a feeling of loneliness. Who is fooled by that fatuous legalism? So not only is the Emperor attempting to get little removed via the gift of Arrakis, but he also makes sure to keep up the aspect of legality. He presents it officially as a gift to him, as a, as a way to say, I trust my Duke to take care of the problems of Arrakis. That way, if the Duke doesn't manage because he gets forcibly removed, the Emperor can just wash his hands of it and say, well, it was his fault. He betrayed me by not being able to fulfill the duty that I put on his shoulders, which is the sign that even with all of this power, the Emperor can just go out of his way to crush people in the open, because he still has to maintain the semblance of democracy. He still has to maintain the semblance of equality between him and the Great Houses. You'll have noticed that even when a state or nation is clearly a dictatorship, they never go out of their way to say that. They'll always say, no, no, we are the Democratic Republic of X, which is a very sly way to use the greater good as a cover for your nefarious activities. A good politician will not just chain you to a tree. He'll chain you to a tree and he'll make you believe that it is for your protection. It is for your good. Because that way you don't rebel. And this is very evident here because the emperor doesn't give a single fuck about the population of Arrakis. He doesn't care whether or not the Duke Leto is going to be able to handle all dispute. Because in private, he calls these same people barbarians whose dearest dream is to live outside the ordered security of the Faux And that quote is very telling. Because the number one fear of politicians is you not wanting to exist within the system that they create. Because the person that gives them authoritarian power is you. It's the fact that you let it happen. You are a member. You quote-unquote vote. So you give your approval to your own slavery. If there is a type of people that politicians despise, it's those that don't even play into the system, right? If you bicker and if you oppose, that's great, you're still in the system. But there are a type of people on Arrakis that don't do that, and that is the Fremen. Because the Fremen deny the authority of the Imperium downright, and they don't play the game of politics. So naturally, to him, they must be barbarians. And it is this cynical twang that is absolutely required to make it in politics, and it's a skill that Leto, as we established, doesn't practice properly, right? He's too honest and he's too forthright. Jessica is much better because she was trained by the Bene Gesserit, and that's what the Bene Gesserit do. They scheme and they manipulate. And there is something actually that she says at some point in the book where she understands that it is vital for the, for the Atreides to create a false sense of familiarity with the population of Arrakis by making sure that their men, their fighting men, marry local native women, and also by positioning themselves, Leto and Jessica, as father and mother surrogate to the native people. This is politics, right? You establish yourself as a ruler of a nation, and you make the people believe it's for their good by adopting a paternalist attitude, 
right? You are the on, you are the new father. You are the new mother, and a father and a mother, of course, could only do things for the good of their, of their children, which completely extinguishes any type of distrust that the people might have in you. But there are also more forceful ways to establish yourself over a population. So you can, for example, force them to break their own traditions. When Leto dumps a full glass of clean water on the ground and he forces everyone at the dinner table to do the same, that's exactly what he does. It's a way to say, your traditions matter less than me. My new role is more important than your old ways. Which is extremely dangerous, of course, because it can trigger rebellion. But if you can force people to violate their own moral standards, it is much easier afterwards to force them to do anything else because in their heads, they've already gone so far to obey you that another transgression isn't much. It's what I call violent obedience. And this is also a method you will see politicians use often. Because as we saw, politicians are not afraid of using violence. They're afraid of using violence in the open. As long as it is kept quiet and kept legal, you can, you can rejoice in all of the violence that you want. As long as the conventions tell you that you're okay to do so. So in Dune, we have, for example, the concept of kindly. Kindly is regulated violence. It means that you can be a great house and swear kindly against another house and go and massacre every single one of them. As long as you announced previously that you are going in, that is fine. That is considered fair and it's considered legal. As long, of course, as you follow the Great Convention. And the Great Convention can be renamed the Great Joke. It's the equivalent of our Geneva Conventions. Meaning that we are so fucked up as a species that we have had to establish a list of things that we're not allowed to do when we kill each other, which also stipulates that the rest is fine, right? We should just have a piece of paper that says, don't kill each other assholes, but we can do that. We like it too much. It's too important to us. So instead, it's don't use white phosphor, don't use this weapon, don't torture too much, but for the rest, open bar. And we also know that even these very few rules that we're supposed to adhere to, we don't. There are plenty of countries that I'm not going to cite that gleefully ignore the Geneva Convention because they know, they know there's no repercussion. And it's a bit different in Dune because the punishment for not respecting the convention is much more severe because the conventions are very clear. The only thing you're not allowed to do is you're not allowed to use atomics. If you use nuclear weapons against another house, every other house is going to use their atomics to obliterate your planet, your entire fucking planet, which naturally is going to deter a lot of people. It's also highly hypocritical. You can't use that mean. If you use that mean, we're going to use that mean against you. Once again, we see that if there is any shred of honesty left in this world, it is not in politics. So to survive this world of politics, our main character, Paul, is going to have to accept that hypocrisy is an inherent part of it and it's something that he does well. He is well adapted to it because he was trained for it from a young age. And I have another quote to demonstrate this. You sense that Arrakis could be a paradise, Kain said. Yet as you see, the Imperium sends here only its trained hatched men, its seekers after the spice. Paul held up his thumb with its ducal signet. Do you see this ring? Yes. Do you know its significance? I'm a soldier of the Imperium, Paul said. Technically, a hatched man. Kain's face darkened. Even with the Emperor's Sardo car standing over your father's body? The Sardo car are one thing. The legal source of my authority is another. And that's that slyness we're talking about. It is true that technically, the Emperor never stripped the Atreides from the possession of Arrakis. The Atreides still own Arrakis, but because their entire line was supposed to be extinct, it was given back to the Arconid. But legally speaking, if there is still an Atreides alive, then Arrakis legally belongs to him. That is what Paul is saying here. All of the violence and the massacre of House Atreides, yes, matters, but legally speaking, all of this was done following the Great Convention, so he has nothing to complain about. He cannot show up in the face of the Emperor and say, the Arconans didn't play fair and I want my, my planet back. It wouldn't work like this. He has to accept that if he wants to win against hypocrites, he has to be an hypocrite himself. Because in a world where only profit and powers matter, justice is just a word. It means absolutely nothing. Justice is decided by the people who have the power. If they decide that they don't want 
to allow justice to serve your cause, then they will just manipulate the legal system and that is it and you will have nothing to show for it. So you have to understand what these people want. What is their benefit in your situation? And in Paul's situation, his benefit is the fact that the emperor has no sons. Meaning that if he can blackmail the emperor into saying, hey, I have proof that you schemed against House Atreides, and if this is revealed, the great houses are going to bend against you because naturally their greatest fear is what happened to House Atreides. It's to be picked off one by one by Sardaukar. If they are isolated, they have no protection. So the second they, he they hear about what the Emperor did and there is proof, they're just going to bend together and there will be chaos. So it is in the best interest of the Emperor that this is never revealed, so he might very well accept Paul as the next in line for the throne as long as it protects the entirety of the Empire because the first priority of the ruling class is to maintain the status quo because as long as there is political stability, their jobs are not in danger. Even if your life sucks in your country, it doesn't matter to them, they still have a job. And this is a fact that is demonstrated by a passage that is not in the movies where when the Emperor learns about the manner of death of Duke Leto, he enters a rage, which is interesting because he ordered his death. But what enrages him is to learn how, how miserable his death was, because it reminds him that just because you're a royal person doesn't mean that you're going to be protected from the direct consequences of violence if your plan is defeated. And so, this is once again this, this obsession with the status quo. The fact that a royal person could die like a lay person struck a chord at the heart of the emperor. And it is usually that fear of losing everything that motivates people to perpetuate themselves. This is what motivates people to start a political party, for example, or a family, so that the empire can continue even if they die, which is why it was extremely important that Paul get killed as well during the destruction of the Atreides Empire, because just removing Leto wasn't enough. As long as the blood is still alive, then there is still a risk to the status quo. So that's the second big priority of a political power. It's to perpetuate itself, especially in a feudal system like the one that we see in Dune, where the power is essentially always handed from parent to offspring meaning that the familial unit is the nucleus of all intrigues, because this is what the power is. As Ireland Princess Ireland says, a royal family is not like a normal family. And she explains in that quote that her own dad, times and times again, attempted to have her murdered. Even his own daughter is a potential threat to his throne and to his power. And that links back to the topic of the Bene Gesserit. So the way it functions and the way our system intermashes itself with the royal blood is that the Bene Gesserit originally were witches with great powers. And these great powers were, of course, desired by those who seeked political authority. So what ended up happening is that because these were all women, they managed to marry themselves to very important players the husband would receive that power, receive that guidance, and in return, the Bene Gesserit get to manipulate people from the shadow. They get to play that political role. And one of such role is the fact that they decide what your descendants will be. So your wife, by taking order from the Reverend Mother, can tell you, okay, I will give you a daughter I will, or I will give you a son. And unfortunately for the Emperor, he was never granted a son. It's never quite explained why, I suppose it's because the Bene Gesserit knew that if they allowed him a legal son, it could potentially create problems because it would create a dynasty that would be too powerful. It's explained later on in the, the, uh, the following books, but I promise I won't spoil you. So in this book, only all we know is that the, <coughs> sorry, all we know is that the most powerful player of the whole universe of Dune is still being cock-blocked by the Bene Gesserit which goes to show the immense political power that these witches have. Their plan being that they wanted to do this to make sure that that way power could be handed to one of his daughters, who would also be a Bene Gesserit, who could be married off to another man from a great house in order to promote unity, which in this case, this man would be Paul. So this is where Paul comes in. Paul could actually fulfill that role and he could preserve the status quo. 
and that is the third leg of the tripod that makes up the power structure that supports the Imperium. The first one is wealth, the second one is military power, and the third one is descendants. And as we see, that third leg is stumped, and because it is stumped, the entire tripod is extremely unstable. So if something happens to the other two legs, it's going to fall, and the balance of power is going to be reversed. Which is why it is said that the Emperor is extremely jealous of his Choam directorships and revenue, and why he's so secretive when it comes to his Sardaukar. He's not dumb. He understands that this third leg is not working properly, and so he absolutely has to make sure that the other two are kept in place. And we see that with a scene between the Count Fenrig and Baron Arconen, well, the Count Fenrig comes to him with two problems. The first one being that spice production is slow, so the revenues are not coming in, and two, that there is an issue with the Fremen. And at this point, the Baron, who is not super smart, reveals to him that he wishes to use Arrakis as a prison planet. And the second he says that, Count Fenrig realizes, oh, if he does that, he's going to end up with Sardokar, and we cannot let that happen. But that connects to another aspect of the instability of this tripod, which is the fact that two of the three legs are dependent on one planet. Because if spice production ends, profit ends, and if someone figures out that you can use the Fremen to fight the Sardokar, then the Sardokar are being nullified, and so the Emperor is left with literally nothing. So the population of Arrakis becomes the factor, becomes the lever that will make or break the Imperium and make or break the status quo. Which points to the true nature of politics. The goal of politicians isn't the creation of laws and order to govern a people. All of this is a facade. These roles are created first and foremost to control the people, because if you can control them, you can harness the wealth they can produce, and you can accumulate more power for yourself. So once we accept this fact, we also have to understand that what matters the most to politicians is not what makes you happy. Instead, it what's, it's what makes you mad, because the things that make you mad or, or, or upset are the things that are going to motivate you to rebel, to revolt, which would then make it impossible for them to control you, which would have them lose their wealth, their resources, and their power. Meaning that in this context, the most important science of governance is what Count Fengri calls a science of discontentment. Which leads to another great quote from a great book. It was dawn in an instant, and she straightened, beckoned his handlers, buried his slave intact with his knife in his hands, he said. The man earned it. In the golden box, Count Fenrig leaned close to the Baron, said, A grand gesture, that. True bravura. Your nephew has star as well as courage. He insults the crowd by refusing the head, the Baron muttered. Not at all, Lady Fenrig said. She turned, looking up at the tears around them. They like what your nephew did, she said. As the import of Faith Rota's gesture penetrated to the most distant seats, as the people saw the endless carrying off the dead gladiator intact, the Baron watched them and realized she had interpreted the reaction correctly. The people were going wild, beating on each other, screaming and stamping. The Baron spoke wearily. I shall have to order a fete. You cannot send home people like this, their energies unspent. They must see that I share their elation. He gave a hand signal to his guard, and a servant above them dipped the Arconan orange pennant over the box. Once, twice, three times. Signal for a fete. So this is at the end of one of the Arconan festivals where Faith Rotha kills a unattrated slave. And it's so interesting because we know that the Arconan wood, Gidi Prime, is a hellhole, where the majority of people are very, very poor. But even in this dire situation, as long as the Baron is able to manage their discontent, everything is fine. He gives them du pain et des jeux. He gives them distractions to take away their discontent and replace it with elation. Their situation hasn't improved. After this game, they go home, they're still as poor. But it doesn't matter. Because there is still a measure of control put in place to ensure that their energy is never redirected against the politicians. So if a political leader loses sight of this science of discontent, he runs the risk of losing his power because he will be losing his people.
as such, if we are to study how a society can transform, we need to focus on the socio-economical factors that give birth to this discontent, but also how these factors are manipulated by the ruling class to maintain the status quo. Which, you guessed it, means that we're going to start talking about Marxist theory. It is now time for us to discuss the importance of Marxism in the universe of Dune, which, if you have been paying attention, contains plenty of class warfare, plenty of oppression, and sizing the means of production. There is actually a lot to say about the topic, so I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion. But before we get into it, to complete the bread tuber cosplay, please remember to check out the coffee page in the first link of the description. If you're still here at this point, I suppose it's because you enjoy my work. So if you feel so inclined, please consider either pledging $3 a month or making a donation. All of that would make my day because it's what allows me to keep making this video. All right, now that I'm done e-begging, let's talk Marxism starting with its core principle of historical materialism. The idea that all human institutions are the outgrowth of their economic activity meaning that any time period is really the result of a material context, which is something that the author makes clear is extremely relevant to the story because Dune is essentially historical materialism 101, as demonstrated by the following quote. Boom, boom, boom. To begin your study of the life of Muad'Dib, then take care that you first place him in his time, born in the 57th year of the Padisha Emperor Shaddam IV, and take the most special care that you locate Muad'Dib in his place, the planet Arrakis. So the spatial temporality of the story is the most important aspect of it to understand the mechanisms that we discussed previously in part 1 and part 2. Because as we've established, Dune is the story of factions struggling for power, and fighting for power essentially means fighting over wealth. Wealth that is directly created by Shram directorship, which depends on the production of spice, spice that depends on the planet Arrakis. So the epicenter of Marxist theory in the entire universe of Dune is that very planet, which unsurprisingly turns out to be the best example of class disparity. Because on Dune, the poor can barely afford water, they can barely afford to drink enough to survive, while the rich have all of the water they want. They actually have so much water they can go out of their way to waste it in displays of power that are completely ridiculous. So in the courtyard of the capital, there are palm trees, 20 of them. Each palm tree requiring enough water to keep five men alive. If you are good at math, you know that. This means that per day, a hundred lives are wasted on useless trees. And as a result, naturally the people greatly resent these trees because it's a big fuck you to them. Because the trees are visible from the outside. So every single day, you have poor people who are dying of thirst who have to look at someone going from tree to tree, wasting water in their face, telling them, hey, your life matters less than this tree that is completely useless. The conditions are so rough on Arrakis that even a slight increase in planetary population leads to riots. Because if you add just an extra 2,000 people, which is not much, there are millions of people on Arrakis, that 2,000 people might be enough to consume enough water to raise the price of water, meaning that the people who are the poorest will, will now no longer be able to afford it. So when House Arconen, House Atreides arrives, these people are ruling class or their middle class or military class. They will not need or want for water, but their simple presence is going to make the life of the native poor population of Arrakis much, much worse, which is the direct result of this insane wealth gap. Something that is completely unconsequential for the very rich is a matter of life and death for the very poor. The point being that the rich don't care about that because they have water. Whatever happens to the poor people who can't drink is completely unconsequential. 
And we see that also with the weirding room. The weirding room is a special room in the real house that is full of greenery because it's being, it's being fed with water 24-7. And it is said that that room could provide a thousand people with drinking water every single day. But instead, it's richly wasted. And it's wasted on something that is even worse than the palm trees because that room is a secret room. There's like two people in the house that know it. It's used only for relaxation, which shows that the luxury of the few prevails over the survival of the many. And that's deeply unjust, which is why, unlike the palm trees, that room is kept hidden. It's kept a secret because if it was revealed that it existed, people would riot again. Naturally, because this is a provocation. And we see that in the structure of Arrakis. So you have the poor people who live outside in like houses, but the ruling class cannot do that because if they did that, they would be exposed to violence. So what they do is they wall themselves. And the more guards they have to hire and the higher the walls have to be, the greater the wealth disparity is. That is actually a good sign that a society is fragmented, right? If you need to actively separate your poor from your rich, it might mean that you have an issue in wealth distribution. An issue which, by the way, cannot be blamed on the poor people. Because the poor, pe the poor people have no control over the economy. Their violence is a reaction to a pre-existing violence. And it's the violence of misery that didn't just fall from the sky. It's established in Iraq on Arrakis that the planet could be a paradise if only its ruling class would stop being so greedy. So, violence is both a consequence and a condition of a class society. Because to impose that disparity of wealth, you have to use non-direct violent means by raising the price of the water, making it completely inaccessible to the people that need it the most, and also a consequence because these people naturally are going to revolt and are going to not be fine with their situation. But what the system and the ruling class will retain is only that secondary violence. And it will point out to this violence to justify its role. It will say, look, Look at these people who are so barbaric. They clearly deserve the treatment that we have for them because they cannot behave. Which is completely backwards because the wealth that allows them to treat poor people like this is created by the labor of poor people. On the right case, it is these poor people who, who farm the spice. It is them who create that resources, these resources that the ruling class then appropriate to sell back to the guild, to the imperium, which then allows their own oppression to be perpetuated. And that is how privilege establishes itself. It's a snowball effect. If you're poor, you're going to get poorer and poorer and poorer. But if you're rich, you're going to be able to use that wealth to buy the labor of the poor, which makes you even richer. And that is, by the way, the history of the great houses. It's something that Leto says himself, where he claims that most of the houses have grown, grown fat by taking few risks. One cannot truly really blame them for this, one can only despise them. Which should, of course, immediately makes us think of House Arconan because that is exactly how they got big, that is how they got their wealth. It was by exploding Arrakis. They didn't take any risk, they, they weren't brave in their endeavor, they literally just spent 80 years stealing the native population and the resources of the planet, and that is that, which is also something that Leto remarks, where he says that harvesting the spice is a process of getting in and getting out with as much as possible. Admirably suited to the Arconan morality. So even someone from a great house has the decency to recognize that all of this wealth production comes from one thing, and that is just the greed of the Lenshrad that come in and they just take. They take as much as they can and they don't really care about the consequences on the population. Which is understandable when you consider the amount of money that you can make from the spice. At some point, Tufir Awat estimates that spice harvests can generate upwards of 10 billion salaries per year, which in our money, because it's possible to make the conversion, is about $1.6 billion a year from one crop, from one crop. 10 grams, 10 grams, a little baggie of spice is around $6 million. If tomorrow a planet was discovered with spice on it in our universe, what do you think would happen? Every nation on earth would flock to it, take the native population, reduce them to slavery, 
humanitarianism be damned and we would make as much money as possible from this planet. Just look at what the gold rush created in terms of atrocities and in terms of just rampant capitalism and you'll understand that since the spice is gold times 1000, it would have the same exact consequences. And just to keep giving you numbers, a handful of spice will buy you a house, right? A massive mansion. A suitcase full of spice can buy you an entire planet. So naturally, any of the great house that gains power over Arrakis is going to use it to make as much money as possible. And there is very little distinction between Archon and Atreides, right? We like the Atreides, but the Atreides still did the same thing that everyone else did. They came in, they made water price rise, and they exploded the population. Now, naturally, Leto was nicer, he didn't oppress them as much, but his very presence was still a form of oppression because he was taking their resources. Which the fact that he didn't want to do it doesn't really matter. We know why he did it. It's because he's the head of a great house and without resources, he cannot survive, right? Wealth is the motor of success in the realm of politics as we established previously. Because for example, if you want to ship members of your house or even military troops to another planet, that will cost you. The guild is going to make you pay out the ass. So if you don't have the resources to pay for that transport, you're literally stuck on your planet, you cannot defend yourself, and you cannot go to other planets to accumulate more wealth. Which is the reality of a system operating under capitalism. Every mechanism of society is just a function of capital. If you don't have capital, you cannot get anything done. And this reality, this capitalist reality, sadly colors every aspect of human life. So at some point of the story, Leto extends an act of kindness towards his workers because he spots a worm and the person that spots a worm gets a bonus. So nicely, instead of taking the money, he's already the head of the house, he distributes the, the bonus throughout the crew. He gives it to every member of the crew. But why does he do that? Is it really just kindness? Or is it because he intuitively understands that by doing this, he's going to make his men like him more, meaning also that they're going to work harder, which is going to net him even more money, right? The amount of cash he will make from the spice they harvest is a million times more than the tiny bonus he gives them. But it's even more vicious than this, because this bonus that looks like a good thing, like a, like a benefit to the worker, is actually a detriment because it goes against the value of human life. You see, because the men are so obsessed with spotting that worm to get that extra cash, they tend to not pay attention to what happens to the men on the ground, meaning that when these men need to be rescued, which is normally the function of the people who fly overhead, they're too busy trying to catch that fucking worm and so they cannot intervene fast enough, which is a sign that capital and profit is more important than human life, even for the people who labor at the hands of the ruling class. And that extends also to the fact that when a worm is coming, and we see that in the movie actually, the men refuse to leave. They refuse to leave the crawler because they think, man, there's so much money in the crawler. I don't want to leave that there. They have integrated the idea and notion that their life is less important than the content of their cargo. And that is only when they have a say in the matter, because sometimes it's not even the men who betray themselves, it's their equipment. So Leto, because he didn't have enough resources and enough cash flow to have two flying, I don't remember the name of the things, it was I think a carriole, he didn't have enough money to have two carriole per crawler, he only had one. When one of them left or was defunct and couldn't function, now the men in the crawler are just doomed to die, strictly because the regime couldn't expend the necessary money for one more. And that is a saying that permeates the story of Dune that is repeated several times. Business makes progress, fortune passes everywhere. Which is a way to say, profit is the most important thing, and whenever there is a chance for us to make profit, we will be making profit. And if that mentality was just present in the Atreides or the people who exploit Arrakis, that would be understandable, they're the ruling class, they're the ones who make money, but no. It permeates every stratus of society as we see in the following quote. I'm glad it didn't come to open battle, the banker said. The people have such hopes the Atreides will bring peace and prosperity. Especially prosperity, Bute said. So here, the fact that we have a banker who talks about peace and prosperity is quite humorous because we know that the only thing he cares about is prosperity. 
But then we have Butte, and Butte is a native member of Arrakis, but he's one who has made money off of the backs of his brothers. And this connects directly to the idea that the only true solidarity is that of the working class. Because once you have someone who escapes that working class and who gets to join the bourgeoisie, even though they are part of the native population, it suddenly doesn't matter. And they will gleefully join the oppressor to exploit the working class as long as there is profit for them in it. The only ones escaping the capitalist paradigm are the Fremen, because in their society, the idea of capital is dominated by the necessity for water, meaning that this, in return, goes on to shape every aspect of their life and their culture. To cite light kinds, the possession of water in great amount can inflict a man with fatal carelessness. So if you are a Fremen and you hold large amount of water, you are going to be seen as engaging in a reprehensible behavior, because water is a finite and consumable resource, and it's essential for human life. So, if you refuse to share, and if you just keep these amounts for yourself, that you will never be able to use, because again, it's a consumable, that is seen as a crime against the tribe. It's seen as a tribe, as a crime against other humans. Whereas, in a system where capital exists under a volatile monetary form, so it could be coins, it could be paper money, it could be digital money, the same thing doesn't apply. Now you can gather as much as you want because you're technically not taking anything away from other people. Which technically is true because unlike water, we can just create more money. So the notion that if you have some and I have none, then you should share because you're preventing me from having some is not technically true. Of course, economics are more complex than that and this is what, not what we're here to discuss today. What I want to point out is the fact that by having water as their main capital, the Fremen have created a society that has to be ethical, because if it's not ethical, people simply die. Which you might argue is also true in our system, but it's much more straightforward in Fremen society. You cannot escape that reality when you live out in the desert. So their very material context means that they have to be anti-capitalist by default. But not just anti-capitalist, they are also collectivists. Because for that same reason, the survival of the many depends on the ability of the individual to share. If you have plenty of water, you are going to give to those who don't have, because you know that if one day you are in a pickle, these same people will share with you. And this goes very far, because as long as you are alive as a Fremen, your water belongs to you, because you can make use of it, but once you die, since you don't have a use for it anymore, it is immediately reclaimed by your tribe. Leading to quote 20. Peace, friend, the Fremen cautioned. What do your wanted say? Are there those among them who can see the water need of your tribe? So that is collectivism taken to a level that is incomprehensible to us. Because here we have a situation where you have men who are not yet dead, who are just wanted, who could potentially give their life to the rest of the tribe to keep the entire tribe alive. And the question is, would that be possible in our society? Would people be willing to sacrifice themselves knowing, oh, by doing this, I preserve the integrity of my people? I think that it wouldn't be possible because we live in a material context that simply doesn't justify that type of behavior. We are individualists because we are capitalists and not the other way around. And to this, you could say, okay, well, that's fine and all, but water is still a form of capital. So how do we explain that greed as a behavior doesn't exist in Fremen society, right? It's nice and all that they are being taught to share, but what else is there to their culture that would motivate people to go to such lengths? Well, that, my friend, is because on top of the necessities of life, the material context, the Fremen have also engineered a culture and also a system of ethics that is deeply anti-greed, as the following quote demonstrates. Stilgar glanced at Jessica. Is this true? Is there water in your pack? Yes. Little joints of it? Two little joints. What was intended with this wealth? Wealth? She thought. She shook her head, feeling the coolness in his voice. Did you know there are those among us who've lost from their catch pockets by accident and will be in sore trouble before we reach Tab this night? So here we have a situation where Jessica, who doesn't have water discipline, 
is carrying an amount of water in her backpack that is considered by the Fremen wealth. Because no one has that much water on them. No one has that much water as their own personal possession. It makes no sense. Water is to be drank or shared. So if you have more than what you can use for yourself or share, people immediately assume that you are trying to hold. So the entire culture polices one another. Which shows that it isn't the pursuit of capital that makes a society capitalist or not. It's the ethics that surrounds that pursuit. You can have a society that is going to be intently motivated by resource seeking, while at the same time having a society that is collectivist and anti-capitalist. It all depends on the relationship we have with the capital we create. And that is also something that Marx insists on when he says that capital is not a thing. It's a social relation. The goal of capitalism is not to abolish capital. That's not possible. It's to modify the relationship we have with capital to make sure that we move away from a system of exploitation into a system that is more motivated by providing each individual with what they need to live, to have a good life. And that's what the Fremen have managed to create. On the other side, however, you have an hyper-capitalist society like the Arconen, who are intently motivated by the pursuit of resource for their own sake, not for the sake of the group. And unsurprisingly, that is also the society that oppressed and exploited Dune for the spice for decades. Which goes to show that their priorities are not in the same place. Because all of the wealth that the Arcanon managed to create from exploiting Dune was used for one thing and one thing only, and that was the raid against the Atreides. The raid cost them an equivalent of 50 years of spice harvest. If I were to translate that into our money, that's 80 billion dollars. So the Baron and his empire exploited the people for 50 years and then spent all of that to destroy another empire. Where is the common good in this? Where is the sharing? The entire enterprise was for destruction and destruction only, which didn't even result in his home world becoming richer, right? Let's say your country, you go and you colonize another nation and you ruin them. Okay, great. You destroy your rivals. Excellent. At least your country should be rich. Everyone should be doing well in your country, but not, that's not even the case. The Arconan Empire is an empire where, unsurprisingly also, wealth disparity is extremely prevalent, which is the exact opposite of the Fremen, because in Fremen society, there is no wealth disparity. No one is going to carry 50 million liters of water while someone can barely fill up a water bottle. It is made impossible by their ethics. Meaning that it is this individualistic ethic of Arcanon society that allows wealth to be concentrated in the hands of the ruling class and the ruling class only. And that ruling class makes sure that it's never redistributed. But if there is one thing that the Fremen and the Arcanon have in common, it's this. They're both dependent on the guild. Because having a monopoly on transportation is the ultimate power in a society where the trading of goods, including spice, is the main source of revenue for everyone. Add to that the transport of troops that is extremely costly, and you see the two levels of power we discussed previously, wealth and military power, all concentrated in the hands of one entity, which naturally gives them free reign to squeeze their clients as much as they want, because they have no competition. It's like if tomorrow there was an airline in your country, one airline, you are fucked. They could raise their prices as much as they want. What are you going to do? Walk? Take the train? No, you have to fly with them. And that leads to a quote by our dear friend, Le Baron Arconen, page 300. And not for the first time, the Baron wondered if there ever would come a day when the guild might be circumvented. They were insidious, bleeding off just enough to keep the host from objecting until they had you in their fist or they could force you to pay and pay and pay. Always the exorbitant demands rolled upon military ventures, as out rates the early guild agents explained, and for every agent you managed to insert as a watchdog in the guild bank structure, they put two in your system. So the guild is the ultimate capitalistic enterprise. They have a monopoly that you cannot challenge. When they start you off, they start you off with prices are reasonable at first until you become so dependent that they can just raise the prices until you literally don't have a, a choice. They just bleed you to death. And on top of that, 
they make up bullshit reasons to up their fare. So they'll tell you, oh, it's just hazard rates. We don't know something could happen, hazard rate, pay more. What, what can you do to that? What can you answer to that? You don't have an answer. This is your only choice. And that is the nature of a monopoly that is also a product of capitalist society. Because the notion that the free market is fair and it regulates itself is unfortunately bullshit for what we explained previously. If you have a society or a company that manages to gain a lot of power and wealth, they gain levers on smaller companies that they can buy or they can just destroy right off the bat to maintain their monopoly. But at least the guild is a human entity. So its motivations and intentions can be understood. There is another entity in the wood of Dune that is even more powerful than the guild. And that is the spice. The spice is the most powerful force in the entire universe because everyone depends on it, including the guild. And because of that, the spice takes on a power, but also a life of its own, which is an aspect of Marxist theory that is scarcely discussed, but Marx also points it out when he says that the relation between things, man's operation with them, becomes the operation of an entity outside man and above man. His slavery, therefore, reaches its peak. It is clear that this entity now becomes a real god, for the mediator is the real power over what it mediates to me. So essentially, if we look at the pyramid of profit of the capitalist system that we see in Dune, everything hinges on the spice. And so the spice becomes the god of this system because without it, nothing is possible. And describing it as a system of slavery is quite adept because in truth, it is that. People are slaves to the spice. Because once you start consuming the spice, sure, your life is being prolonged, but at what cost? It's prolonging, prolonging your life because now if you stop consuming that spice, you die. So it's a parasite that keeps you alive so you can, you can keep slaving away to, to actually acquire the spice to keep consuming it, which I think is a perfect analogy for a capitalist system. You don't have a choice. Once you are in the system, you now have to slave away because if you stop, you are no longer giving resources and you can no longer provide yourself with the necessary ingredients to prolong it your life. And this, regardless of if you oppose capitalism or not, is true. Once you're part of the system, that's it, you're in, just like in Dune. The Fremen are not part of the entire spice thing. They are doing their own thing with their own system that should technically preserve them from it. But does it? They're also all addicted to the spice. So what started as a commodity eventually commodifies the people that consume it, which turns it into what Marx calls a god. And I think that this is accurate because you are now forced to tore away under the guidance of this god or you die. And eventually, such a system takes its toll on the people that slave under it. Because the god of capitalism is so ruthless that eventually, to, to be able to survive in the system, you have to become ruthless yourself. And it's something that we see with the smugglers of Dune, who depend entirely on the spice. At some point, one of them says, a time of upset is a rare opportunity for business. So now in his brain, human suffering has become just another avenue for profit. He has engineered an entire new morality and system of ethics that justifies his action because at the end of the day, he's just following the orders of his god. But this has consequences because if some people profit, other people are on the other hand of the profit. And since profit is birthed from misery, at some point or the other, all of this wealth that is going to be concentrated in the ruling class is going to result in the misery that the wealth creates trickling downwards directly onto the working class. And at this point, we're like getting deep into Marxist theory. And you might think, dude, you're reading way into it. It's not in Dune. It's not in Dune. Listen to this. The historical system of mutual pillage and extortion stops here on Arrakis, his father said. You cannot go on forever, stealing what you need without regard to those who come after. The physical qualities of a planet are written into its economic and political record. We have the record in front of us and our course is obvious. Arrakis is a one-crop planet. One crop. 
it supports a ruling class that lives as ruling classes have lived in all times, while beneath them, a semi-human mass of semi-slaves exists on the leavings. It's the masses and the leavings that occupy our attention. These are far more valuable than has ever been suspected. So both Dune and Marx agree on this. The end of capitalist exploitation can only come at the hands of the working class. And what is needed to get that done is a global awakening of the worker's conscience, which is something known as class awareness. Class awareness that many people lack, which is highly beneficial to the ruling class because the ruling class has class awareness. They know they're rich and they absolutely treat each other with that in mind. When they interact with the poor, with the working class, they also keep that in mind because their goal is to maintain their supremacy. The thing that is crazy is the fact that these people are a supra minority. How do they manage to exploit so much? How do they get away with it? Well, it's for this reason. It's because the working class has no class consciousness. They don't think of themselves as working class because if they did, they would start to build up class solidarity and that is the element that would threaten the hegemony of the ruling class. Which is what Keynes in the text calls the bravery of a whole population. And this was his plan. The, the father of light Keynes, parted Keynes, wanted to awaken the Fremen, not just so that they could stand up to the oppressor, but also because it was a way to instill a communist morality in them. A morality that, as we established previously, is based on intolerance of social partisism, greed, and acquisitiveness. And in that regard, he used religion and he used law. I don't want you to think that the Fremen were just like blank pages before Kynes arrived and taught them these things. Their culture was already predisposed to accept anti-capitalist and collectivist ideas. But by putting in place actual laws that punish those that go against the good of the tribe, he also made sure that that culture now had like a real significance. And this is something that we're going to discuss later. It's also what precipitated the jihad. Because Kynes, without realizing it, started to intermix and intertwine law and religion. And when law becomes the word of God, yes, it is highly powerful because people are going to be super, super obedient to it. So it's going to serve the purpose it must serve, but it can also easily be taken over and turned into fanaticism, which is something that Kynes was aware of. It is said at some point that he was trying at all costs to avoid the bravery of individuals. He did not want prophets to erupt from within the Fremen because the prophet oftentimes take away from the collectivist idea and mindset. Now, the energy of the population and their awareness of being a population is captured by this one person. So it defeats the entire purpose. And this is also something that Marx insists on. Marx was against the providential man. He did not want a one-person revolution because a one-person revolution is very easy to extinguish. You just have to kill that person. And worse, if that person is ill-intentioned, which most humans that have the power to become leaders are, then it's just going to take over. And we've seen that times and times again in history. How many times have we seen communist revolution that then lead to terrible situations for the people that were promised a better life? Why? Because they made the mistake of following that one man. But naturally, it is tempting. It is tempting when you have someone who tells you that he will build your utopia on earth as long as you follow him. The problem being that this one man is very unlikely to touch and modify the core issue of the system. And this is what is needed. If the goal is to go against the capitalist system, what must be modified is the system. And at the risk of enraging some of the most hardcore Marxists that are watching this right now, this can also be done by preserving the existence of private property. Because Freeman society hasn't abolished private property. You can still own things that are your own. The individual is in full ownership of his possessions and of his water. It is said that in death, he must give them up. That is only logical. You have no use of these resources anymore. Meaning that symbolically in Fremen society, you're not allowed to take anything to your grave. Once past the point of usefulness to you, it belongs to the tribe. It belongs to people who are going to be able to make use of these things. And I insist on the tribe, not your family. If you get defeated in battle or out in the desert with your troop, 
they have a ritual held for you where they're going to put all of your possessions on a pile and then everyone from the troop is going to be able to pick from that pile, which also means that Fremen society has effectively abolished inheritance, which from a material standpoint is extremely smart because it means that it is impossible for anyone to accumulate wealth. Since if you accumulate too much wealth, Fremen are going to look at you as greedy, one of them or multiple of them are going to call you out until one of them manages to kill you, and once you get killed, your capital, your wealth is redistributed equally to the tribe. Imagine if we had this in our society. You come across Bill Gates, you know, like, hey, you and me one-on-one, -on -one, knife. And if I beat you, I take all of your fortune and I give, it, I give it back to humanity. Within two weeks, there's not a billionaire left on the planet, which naturally will never be put in place because it would create chaos and it would completely shatter order. But I find it very interesting because if you think about it, there is a much easier way to end capitalism and it doesn't really require people to just go out with a knife to hunt billionaires. Instead, you can just abolish inheritance. You can make heritage illegal, meaning that once someone dies, they're not allowed to give their money to their kids. That money is taken by the state and redistributed, which is something that everyone opposes, me included, right? If I have kids one day, I want them to get all of the work that I had done throughout my life. I want my money to go to them, not people that I don't know. So here we are faced with a Marxist imperative that would be incredibly efficient because within one generation of this being put in place, capitalism would collapse. It would be no longer possible for people to accumulate capital and to use it to exploit the working class. But at the same time, even hardcore Marxists in European countries that have far left political parties never put that in their laws. They never put that in their list of measures they want to, they want to put in place because even they understand that it is way too extreme and that no one is going to agree with it. But since in Fremen society, this is a cultural obligation, no one questions it. It's part of their culture, and that is that. And the reason why people don't question it is not because they are subservient, it's because they know that this leads to a final goal. That final goal, which also aligns perfectly with the communist ideal, the pulling together of everyone's resources to turn the world into a utopia. In the case of the Fremen, these resources being water. The reason why the Fremen are okay with all of these crazy roles is because they know that at the end of the day, this is what is going to build their paradise. Because their goal is to take the water of every single tribe on the planet to use it to transform the planet into a green paradise. Leading to one of my favorite quotes from the book. She looked down the shadowy line of Fremen, so Stolgar with Paul standing beside him, and the water masters emptying their load into the pool through a flow matter. The matter was a round gray eye above the pool's rim. She saw its glowing pointer move as the water flowed through it, saw the pointer stop at 33 liters, 7 and 3.30 second drags. There are Jews among us in need of water, Stolga said. Yet, they would come here and not touch this water. Do you know why? Because they know it is for the future. It has been calculated with precision. We know to within a million decaliters how much we need. When we have it, we shall change the face of Arrakis. And no man ever again shall want for water. It shall be his for dipping from well or pond or lake or canal. It shall run down through the canats to feed our plants. It shall be there for any man to take. It shall be his for holding out his hand. This is a fascinating prospect because what Jessica is being presented is the equivalent of a communist bank, meaning that everyone puts their water in the bank and it's no longer their water, it's the tribe's water. And everyone is okay with this because they understand that their personal interest is only secondary to the future of the Fremen. They are okay with not having access to that water, not being able to drink that water, if it means that in the future, no one will want for water. And that to me is the sign of a very healthy civilization and society where people are willing to sacrifice for future generation. Compare this to our wood. Compare this to the boomers who sacrificed everyone that came after him for their own sake, for their own pleasure, because they were just more interested in their own personal hedonistic pursuit of existence.
And we can't really blame them. Again, this is what happens when you have a system that is hyper individualistic. People are trained to think like this. And if you want something like the Fremen paradise, you have to retrain people and the way they think about capital and the way they think about wealth. What is wealth? Is it something for me to use for my benefit? Or is it something to be leveraged for the benefit of everyone? Keeping in mind also that this doesn't make Fremen society a pacifist society. Fremen society is a warrior culture, it is hyper-violent. But the two are not necessarily separated, right? This notion that our society, which is highly pacifist, is somehow better because it is non-violent is nonsensical. Our society is deeply violent. It is the violence of the ruling class against the working class. It is a violence that is almost invisible to the naked eye. In Fremen society, it's the opposite. That invisible violence doesn't exist. What you see is the violence of ritualistic combat for the goal of achieving a society where violence will no longer be necessary. Now, let us compare this to a system that is much closer to our own in the Arkonian Empire, quote 25. The old baron had decreed a meridian to meridian rest from labor, an effort had been spent in the family city of Arco to create the illusion of gaiety. Banners flew from buildings, new paint had been splashed on the walls along Courtway. But off the main way, Count Fenrig and his lady noted the rubbish heaps, the scabrous brown walls reflected in the dark puddles of the streets, and the furtive scurrying of the people. In the Baron's blue walled keep, there was filth for perfection, but the Count and his lady saw the price being paid. Guards everywhere and weapons with that special sheen that told a trained eye they were in regular use. There were checkpoints for routine passage from area to area, even within the keep. The servants revealed their military training in the way they walked, in the set of their shoulders, in the way their eyes watched and watched and watched. This is a society that, like our own, looks to be wealthy from the outside, but if you actually pay attention, you see that this wealth is built off of the misery and the poverty of the working class, the working class that is being actively oppressed. But not just oppressed, they're also being denied the most important thing for a human, which is dignity. Look at the Fremen lifestyle. The Fremen lifestyle is highly dignified. And yet these are people who literally live in the desert, whose life is extremely tough. But if I had to pick between living on Gidi Prime or living on Arrakis as a Fremen, I would pick living as a Fremen, because at least you have that dignity and you have the solidarity of your brothers. You know that you are suffering for a reason. You're suffering because you're going to provide the future generation with a better life. Can the working class of the world right now say this? Say this? Are they actively laboring to create a better life for their kids? Or are they just going to create a life for their kids that is going to be just as bad, if not worse? So seen through this lens, the clash between Fremen and Arkonen is really just an allegory of an oppressed working class struggling against an exploitative ruling class that only thinks about profit. Which is why, even if you have never read Marxist theory, or if you don't agree with what I'm saying in this segment, you most likely also side with the Fremen. Which shows that there is something in you that resembles class awareness, because you know that, most likely, if you are catapulted in the world of Dune, you would also be on the Fremen side you would not be part of that ruling class. And if you were put in that position, most likely, you would also rebel against the Arkonen. And if your goal was to overthrow them and push away that ruling class, you would have to focus on the same thing that the Fremen focus on and that Paul focus on, which is capital, in this case, spice. Because according to Marx, the class, which has the means of material production at its disposal, has control at the same time over the means of mental production, so that thereby, generally speaking, the ideas of those who lack the means of mental production are subject to it. If you want to be able to awaken the people who are being utilized for their labor, you have to seize the mean that allows the ruling class to tap into that labor, and that is the means of production. And this idea is actually taken a step further in Dune. Because it's not just about sizing the means of production, it's also potentially being able to destroy them. Now we're going to go to Paul, quote 26. Arrakis is crawling with guild agents. They're buying spies as though it were the most precious thing in the universe. It is the most precious thing in the universe, Paul said. To them, 
He looked towards Tolgar and Chani, who are now crossing the chamber toward him. And we control it, Gurney. The Arkonans control it, Gurney protested. The people who can destroy a thing, they control it. So since everyone is dependent on the spies as the god of the universe of Dune, he, who becomes able to destroy that god, also coincidentally controls the wood. And this is Paul's big blackmail. This is how he manages to subdue the guild. Or he tells them, hey, I can destroy the thing that allows you to have a monopoly on space travel. And not only that, if I remove it, you also die. So you have to obey me, you don't have a choice. Which also shows how fragile the capitalist system might be. Because as long as you control the lever that moves it, which is its main source of capital, you control everything else. Showing also the irony of capitalism in itself, at least in the world of Dune. Because if you think about it, the guild started to take the spice and to commerce with the spice to be able to gain a monopoly on space travel. And now they are forced to maintain that monopoly on space travel to acquire the spice. To the point that they are even willing to lower their fare to make space travel cheaper as long as it allows the great houses to go to Arrakis to defeat Po. That is how much they are dependent on the spice. And it's not just them, it's also the rest of the Imperium. And since we established that the production of spice is entirely dependent on the exploitation of the people of Arrakis, we can also surmise that the power of the Imperium and of any capitalist system or empire is also based entirely on exploitation. Because if they can no longer exploit Arrakis, the entirety of the system collapses. And there's a scene in the, at the end of book one where the emperor is supposed to raise a flag to show either allegiance to the Arconan or allegiance to the Atreides. To, say, to, to tell to Paul, either yes, I recognize your claim over Arrakis and so I will let you deal with the Arconan, or no, I side with them and you will have to face me. But the emperor does none of these things. Instead, he flies the flag of the Shoam. So in a sense, he flies the, he flies the flag of capitalism. He says, here is where my allegiance lays. I am loyal only to profit. And since profit comes from exploitation, if you can somehow convince the population that is being exploited to rebel, then you also kill the entire system. And this is why Paul's fight was twofold. It was, yes, one, to control the spies via the means we just explained, but it was also to awaken the native population. Quote 27, page 570. It's just that they haven't yet learned how to escape their bondage. We'll teach them. They're all taught the odds, Paul said. They know every Sardaukar they will kill will be one less for us. You see, gentlemen, they have something to die for. They've discovered there are people, they're awakening. So this confirms Marx's suspicions that if you want to destroy a capitalist system, you have to control the means of production, so as to control capital, and you also have to make sure that the people are trained in the way that is going to allow an entire system of ethic to replace the capitalist ethic. And that in Dune is also presented as something that is beneficial for the whole of humanity. Quote 28. And he thought then about the guild, the force that had specialized for so long that it had become a parasite, unable to exist independently of the life upon which it fed. They had never dared grasp the sword, and now they could not grasp it. They might have taken Arrakis when they realized the error of specializing on the melange awareness spectrum narcotic for their navigators. They could have done this, lived their glorious days and died. Instead, they existed from moment to moment, hoping the scene which they swam might produce a new host when the old one died. The guild navigators, gifted with limited prescience, had made the fatal decision. They'd chosen always the clear, safe course that leads ever downward into stagnation. And this is the last Marxist notion we'll discuss in this segment. The fact that, unlike what some people want to think, capitalism in itself is not a vector of progression. It is not what is pushing humanity forward. If anything, is what is keeping us stagnant. Because when you concentrate all of the resources in few hands, and you create monopolies, the only thing it does is, 
it encourages these people to keep doing the same thing, so to become lazy, which then leads to capital just staying dormant. And since, as we've seen, capital is not just wealth, it's also human interaction, it means that the human interactions themselves stop changing and they stop, they stop evolving. And since these relationships tend to be exploitative by default, which creates a lot of suffering in the majority of people, that can never be described as a system that is self-sustaining or even beneficial for humanity. And that's for both sides, because one could say, well, okay, maybe I'm going to still side with the capitalists because I wish to become, become one one day, so fuck the working class. That is fine and all, but understand that we see from the guild, from what happened to the guild, that even the ruling class ends up suffering from the very system they benefit from because they're still slaves to the god that they created. And so they too experience a form of moral degeneration. What we must study now is how this power establishes itself, but also the mechanisms that it puts in place to justify its existence as power. It's now time for us to leave the scientific objectivity of Marxist theory to delve into the uncertain and murky waters of postmodernist subjectivism, in order to answer the following question. What role does ideology play in asserting and maintaining economic and political power in the world of Dune? Most systems of governance base their legitimacy on the righteousness or the legality of their role. But if you dig a bit, you soon find out that oftentimes they're also the ones who created the systems of values or laws that legitimate their power in the first place. History being a good example. History tends to just be something utilized to justify the regime in place. When that regime is replaced, history also changes because it has to adapt to the new regime. And that is the subjectivism I was just talking about, because that definition naturally to an historian is blasphemy. History is objective. Well, yes, if you are honest, but if you want to utilize it to gain power, you can just modify it to suit your needs. And this is a key aspect of postmodernist philosophy, the notion that the truth is just another instrument of power, something that the story is keenly aware of because very early on, we are told that Paul can sense truth and when told, you know when people believe what they say, he answers, I know it. Now, notice the way the sentence is phrased. You know when people believe what they say, not when they tell the truth. Because in this universe, there is no such thing as the truth. The truth is what you believe is the truth. And more importantly, what other people are going to believe is the truth. Because if you can convince them of something that is beneficial to your cause, then you can manipulate these people into doing what you want. That is the principle of ideology. So for example, if you want to create a legitimate reason to oppress and exploit people, you can simply say that it's because it was always in their nature to be exploited. And that's what happens to the people of Arrakis. When they are being described by their colonizers, they are described as mongrels or violent savages, which is something that oppressors have done times and times again. And by oppressor and colonizer, I don't just mean white people or Europeans, because every single group of human on the face of this planet has done that at some point or the other. For this video, I was researching uh, Native American or First Nation history, and I found that times and times again. I kept seeing texts where you had one tribe, one group of natives, who would describe another group as stealers of children and eaters of human flesh. Why? Because it was a way to paint them as savages to justify their massacre and then the taking of their land. They didn't need the white man to learn these things, right? These ideological strategies have always been there. Every group of human has used it to gain more power. And oftentimes it relies on a type of naturalistic fallacies that resemble something like this. If these people are oppressed, is because they are inferior. Because if they weren't, I couldn't oppress them. This, in return, justifies their oppression, and it also means that I am superior. That was the mindset for slavery. Regardless of the type of people enslaved, white, black, it didn't matter. The notion was that because we are able to put them in slavery, this means they are weak, so they are naturally born slaves, so me using them as slaves is perfectly normal. 
And this is also true in Dune. If we look at the Arconan, their policy when it came to planetary population was as follows. Spend as little as possible to maintain them. The phrasing in this is, is very clear. The population are just tools to be used. They're not really human. We are going to expend resources to make sure they don't die, not because we want to keep them alive, because we are humanitarian, but because if they die, we are going to lose labor. So it's a pure, cold and calculated decision. And this is what some call the commodification of human beings. When a human is no longer valued for his humanity, but for what it can produce. So for the ind indigenous people of Arrakis, it's either their ability to produce wealth via spice harvesting or their ability to produce pleasure because the Arkonen also enjoyed hunting the natives. And this is not an indictment on the Arkonen. The Arkonen are naturally the big colonizer villain of the story, something that the movie really insists on. But what the movies fail to show is that the Atreides are just as bad and the rest of the great houses are just as bad because they're all colonizers. They have all built their empire off of the invading and exploitation of other planets. Planets that they describe as uncivilized because that way they can justify coming in. They can say, well, we're teaching these people how to behave like normal humans. They should be thankful to us which naturally also justifies occupation and then the pillage of these people's resources. And to that, you could ask, what about justice? And I would answer in a postmodernist way, what justice are we talking about? Because justice is a man-made fabrication. So if we're talking about the justice of the colonizers, well, you're going to find that that justice aligns perfectly with their political and economical privilege. And this is also something that the Duke Leto says. The Duke, who is the most politically self-aware character of the entire story, he goes to say that we make our own justice, meaning that we, the colonizer, we, the powerful, make the rules as we go to keep the upper hand and to justify our actions. That's it. There is no grand moral standing in justice, none at all. It is a tool of power. Because power requires two things. The strength to establish rule and then the cunningness to make people believe that the rule is legitimate. And this I think we spoke about in the part about politics, where I said that the most important aspect of restricting people's liberty is to make them believe that you are doing that for their own good. We see that also in Dune. There is a discussion between light kinds and the Ducleto that goes a little bit like this. It is said that the Ducleto rules with the consent of the governed. Sir, I honor and respect the personal dignity of any man who respects my dignity. I am indeed indebted to you, and I always pay my debts. If it is your custom that this knife remains sheathed here, then it is so ordered by me. And if there is any other way we may honor the man who died in our service, you have but to name it. So that's, that's quite the piece right there, because if you read through the line, what is Leto doing? He's attempting to placate light kinds by adhering to the ways of the natives, while at the same time saying, hey, your ways mean shit. I'm the one who says that we follow these ways, which means that in reality, I am replacing your justice with my justice. My justice exists above yours. And that's not even the most dishonest way that power can put in place to legitimate its role. Propaganda is also extremely effective because it's quiet, because it's very sly. Again, quote from page 133. My propaganda corps is one of the finest, the Duke said. We must not run short of film base. Else, how could we flood villages and cities with our information? The people must learn how well I govern them. How would they know if we didn't tell them? So that's another red pill right there. The people will base their estimation of your ability to rule and of the legitimacy of your power based on what you tell them about it. If you flood their scores, if you flood their books and their media with information that points to you being a good, generous and legitimate ruler, that is what they will believe. Because that is the only version of the truth that is available to them. It is said that a lie repeated enough times is the truth and that is absolutely correct. And this is something that Light Kynes perfectly understands. When he says that the Arkanen left, you came. 
he sees the coming and going of colonizers as just a result of the power flowing and ebbing. And he knows that the only way his planet and his people will be free is when they finally manage to appropriate that power for themselves. Which is why control over the truth is so essential and why any political power worth its sort is going to seek first and foremost to control the media. Because the media are the ones who can mass produce truth. So if you have them in your pocket, you can also make sure that the situation can remain the same because you are going to control the perception that people have of the situation. Which is just another way to say that power resides where people think it is. As long as your scenario justifies your power and the people believe in that scenario, then this is all you really need to maintain that power. And usually you'll notice that such scenarios have a set of rules. And these rules are usually what we call laws. As long as the scenario exists within the contentment of the law, a law that everyone agrees upon is for the greater good, then the power that created that very law is going to be able to utilize their creation to perpetuate their power over the people that are subject to the law. Which is why the emperor in Dune used to say that respect for the truth is the basis of all morality. If we look at this statement through the scope of postmodernism, here is the translation. Respect for the official scenario is the basis of any system of governance. Because as long as this truth is believed by all, the power it supports remains in place. And this is exactly what made Paul so dangerous. Because he was a proof that the rules were factitious. He was a proof that the emperor doesn't play by his own rules, which also means that the scenario is bullshit and that it is based on a lie. Since, by surviving the plot, he became a living example of this very hypocrisy that I'm discussing in this segment, which is something that he is keenly aware of. As he says, law is the ultimate science Thus it reads above the emperor's door. I propose to show him law. Since Paul understands that his existence threatens the legitimacy of the entire scenario, he also knows that now he has a lot of power over the Imperium. Because the system lives and dies by its rules. If the great houses discover that the conventions are not followed by the person who addicted them, who is supposed to have them be respected, then they won't respect it either, which will lead to the emperor losing his throne. So, if we are to regard power in that scope, this also means that if you want to either overthrow it, or to replace it, or to even gain it for yourself, the first thing that you must do is to learn the rules by which this power operates. And the best way to do that is through a close observation of the morality of the people who created these rules. So let's start with the typical morality of the oppressor straight from the Baron's mouth. Page 303. Think of these clods as what they are. Slaves, envious of their masters, and awaiting only the opportunity to rebel. Not the slightest vestige of pity or mercy must you show them. Can one exterminate an entire planet? Raven asked. Exterminate? Surprise showed in the swift turning of the Baron's head. Who said anything about exterminating? Well, I presume you were going to bring in new stock and... I said squeeze, nephew, not exterminate. Don't waste the population. Merely drive them into utter submission. You must be the carnivore, my boy. He smiled, a baby's expression on the dimple fat face. A carnivore never stops. Show no mercy. Never stop. Mercy is a chimera. It can be defeated by the stomach rumbling its hunger, by the throat crying its thirst. You must be always hungry and thirsty. The Baron caressed his borders beneath the suspenses. Like me. So this is what power looks like, stripped from all of the bullshit, from all of the media relations, from the scenario, from the rules, and from the so-called truth. This is the true oppressor mindset. To the Baron, there is nothing to the people of Arrakis. They are just, they are literally just, what do, what do we call them? He calls them stuck. They are, quite, they are literally stuck. They are like animals to him. 
But this is also the Baron's biggest flaw. He underestimates the people he oppresses so much that he has a completely skewed view of who they really are. He doesn't understand their culture at all. And so he also doesn't understand that by going after the Atreides, in the same fashion he went after the Fremen, he created a kinship between Paul and these people. And so he created his own defeat. If he had actually taken the time to study the morality of the people that he exploded, he could have avoided that. Because a quick study of the history of the Fremen reveals that there are not a people to be fucked with, as demonstrated by the following quote. There had been Fremen on Poritrin, she saw. A people grown soft with an easy planet, fair game for imperial raiders to harvest and plant human colonies on Bellategus and Salazar Secundus. Oh, the welling Jessica sensed in that parting. Far down the corridor, an image voice screamed. They denied us the Hajj. Jessica slowed the slave cribs on Bellategus down that inner corridor, saw the weeding out and the selecting that spread men to Rozak and Armentep. Scenes of brutal ferocity opened to her like the petals of a terrible flower. And she saw the thread of the past, carried by Sayadina after Sayadina. First by word of mouth, hidden in the sand chanties, then refined through their own reverend mothers with the discovery of the poison drug on Rossock, and now developed to subtle strength on Arrakis in the discovery of the water of life. Far down the inner corridor, another voice screamed, never to forgive, never to forget. So we learn from this that it is not the Fremen's first oppression. These were a peaceful people who were taken from their planets as slaves and then moved from planet to planet also as slaves. It's not their first rodeo. And so their morality hinges on two big factors, the yearning for freedom and the desire for revenge against the people that stole that freedom from them. A morality that they had to develop in response to the oppressor's morality, which is another interesting lesson that we're going to go into right now. The idea that Times and times again, oppressors create their own doom because they give the necessary weapons to the people they oppress to overthrow them with the same violence they used to exploit them in the first place. But that can only really work on a certain type of population because if the population is by nature too soft, they will not be able to answer to that violence. And that is why the first generation of Fremen on Paratrain were a very easy mark because they lived in a generous world. They, live in, they lived on a planet that had no challenges for them whatsoever. So when the Imperial Raiders appeared to make them slaves, they couldn't defend themselves at all. But eventually, by the power of fate, these very same people landed on Arrakis. And Arrakis is the exact opposite. Arrakis provides them with the third factor that makes a people unoppressible. And that is a tough environment to condition these very same people for what must be done, which is a mechanism that goes both ways. Because if this is something that can be used by oppressed people to liberate themselves, those who oppress, if they understand the power of these tough environments, can also engineer a military force for themselves that they will train and transform using these methods. And that is exactly what the Emperor did, because there is a lot of similarities between the Fremen and the Sardaukar, between Arrakis and Salazar Secundus. Except that in the second case, it wasn't done naturally. It was actually done using what we discussed previously, namely the science of discontent. According to Irulan, people need hard times and oppression to develop psychic muscles. And to put that theory to the test, the Emperor created a prison planet, which was genius because at the same time he can say, hey, this is just something I do for the great houses, right? I'm going to take all of the riffraff of the galaxy and I'm going to reduce criminality. But in reality, what he's doing is he's taking these criminals who are already toughened up individuals and he's putting them through the fucking ringer so as to create his own private military. Because it is said that the conditions on Saluza Secundus are more oppressive than anywhere else, with a staggering 60% mortality rate amongst new prisoners. 
to, to give you a point of comparison, for the same population, new prisoners, the worst US prisons have a less than 0.2% mortality rate. Meaning that one out of two people who make it to Saluda Secondus die. And actually the few that manage to survive are going to be tough sons of bitches, which gives birth to the Sardaukar. The Sardaukar is the elite of the elite. They are the best soldiers in the entire galaxy. And because I'm a big Sardaukar fanboy, I'm going to read you the following quote. I would take them in small groups, not larger than platoon strength, Awad said. I'd remove them from their oppressive situation and isolate them with a training cadre of people who understood their background, preferably people who had preceded them from the same oppressive situation. Then I'd fill them with the mystique that their planet had really been a secret training ground to produce just such superior beings as themselves. And all the while, I'd show them what such superior beings could earn. Rich living, beautiful women, fine mentions, whatever they desired. The Baron began to nod, the way the Sardaukar live at home. The recruits come to believe in time that such a place as Saluza Secondus is justified because it produced them, the elite. The commonest Sardaukar trooper lives a life in many respects as exalted as that of any member of a great house. So that's the secondary part of the Sardaukar training, because ultimately, once you start to reward them with all of these riches in exchange for their services, you also make these people intimately understand that the reason why they receive all of that is because of you. It's because you give it to them as their emperor. And these blessings are not free. They are also entirely conditional to their loyalty. So if the Sardaukar loses or if they falter, they also lose all of the benefits that come with their position. It's what we call in French, le bâton et la carotte, the stick and the carrot. Beat them up until they become tough enough and then feed them that carrot to keep them obedient to make sure that this violence that you inflicted upon them is never redirected towards you. If you look at the process that most authoritarian police states go through, it looks exactly like this. First, you get rid of the middle class, which is also going to naturally enlarge the poverty-stricken masses, which has the hidden benefit of bumping up criminality, which then allows you to replace that middle class with a military people whose role is going to be to tackle this criminality that you just created. Their role being, of course, not to protect the working class. Their role is going to protect the ruling class in priority, to serve as a wall between the 1% and the rest of the population. And to make sure that this wall holds, you have to provide these people with a better standard of living than the ones that they have to protect you against. This is exactly what Awat says when he tells the Baron that oppression is a relative thing. Your fighting men are much better off than those around them. They see unpleasant alternatives to being soldiers of the Baron. Being a military member, part of the new middle class, is a million times better than being poor. But these very same people also know that if the ruling class disappears, then their status as middle class also disappears. So when they fight for the ruling class, in reality, they will be fighting for them. And that guarantees that their ferocity is going to be through the roof. So any semblance of solidarity or commiseration they might have towards the people that they're going to beat up on is going to vanish because their own benefit and their own selfishness is going to become the most important thing to them. They would rather be at the end of the baton that smashes rather than the one that gets smashed. Which naturally intrigues the Baron because he thinks to himself, okay, if that is how the Sardaukar are, are built, why couldn't I do the same thing with the Fremen? Why couldn't I recruit directly from the people that have been oppressed by my nephew? I could just come in, replace my nephew, tell these people that I'm there to save them from the oppressor, and then recruit from the toughest members. The added benefit being that it is said in the book that Arrakis is even worse than Saluza Secondus. So now you have an already tough and militarized population that has been oppressed even further, so made even tougher, and on top of that, their less successful specimens were killed by the Arconan, leaving only the strong behind, the strong that then reproduce. 
So here we have the we have the theory of survival of the fittest times 1000. There is only one problem with this plan and that is that the Fremen are no Sardaukar. They have a completely different morality. The idea behind the Sardaukar is that you take prisoners who don't have an identity. And so you give them one as Sardaukar. That is why it's said that the Sardaukar are very prideful because they were literally criminal nothings before they became soldiers of the emperor. And so that status is everything to them. But for the Fremen, the most precious thing they have is their tribe and is their tradition. Which is why I said at the start that the Baron's biggest weakness was his unwillingness to study Fremen culture and morality. Because if he did, he would have known that by oppressing them, he just reinforces their religious convictions. Because Fremen history is an history of oppression. So when you go out of their way to oppress them more, that's not going to make them submit, and that's certainly not going to make them want to work for you. If anything, you now become the justification for them to fight back even harder. And this is a perfect example of power that loses its hegemony because it fails to respect its own rules. The role of the Arconian power was oppression, but they failed to realize that there were consequences of this oppression that could lead to the end of their regime. And if that is true for the Baron, it's also true for the rest of the Great Houses and the rest of the Imperium. A fact that is demonstrated by Paul when he discusses the conventions. And he points out the fact that while these conventions are what the Great Houses and the Imperium use to rule, it is also their greatest weaknesses. Page 559. The injunction, Paul Bart. It's fear. Not the injunction that keeps the houses from hurling atomics against each other. The language of the Great Convention is clear. Use of atomics against humans shall be cause for planetary obliteration. But we're going to blast the short wall, not humans. It's too fine a point, Gunny said. The hair splitters up there will welcome any point, Paul said. So here we have an interesting piece of litigation. Yeah, sure, the conventions prevent you from using atomics against humans. But if I use atomics to break a wall that then allows me to breach your defenses and kill you, technically I did not go against the great conventions. But the issue is that the great houses and the Imperium cannot use the same devious methods against their enemy because they have no idea about the set of rules that the enemy follows, which is demonstrated by the following quote. An old trick, my duke. They thought to burden us with refugees. It's been so long since guerrillas were effective that the mighty have forgotten how to fight them, Paul said. The Sardaukar have played into our hands. They grabbed some silly women for their sport, decorated their battle standards with the heads of the men who objected, and they've built up a fever of hate among people who otherwise would have looked on the coming battle as no more than a great inconvenience and the possibility of exchanging one set of masters for another. So here we see that same ignorance at play. The alliance of the Great House and the Imperium came after just regular people of Arrakis, thinking they're going to frighten the Fremen by this, but the only thing they did is they turned the entire population against them, a population that is not going to side with the Fremen because they are going to side where their benefit is. And since the Sardaukar have made it their mission to kill and maim them, they are certainly not going to side with them. So that's a horrible piece of military strategy, one that comes directly from ignorance of the rules. This demonstrates that the reason why the Imperium eventually loses the war isn't because it was no longer legitimate to rule. Because as we established, there's no such thing as legitimacy. It's something that you create. Rather, their big flaw and their big mistake was that they failed to preserve the protocol that protected that legitimacy in the first place. And this is vital to understand because Dune is not the story of the good guy who triumphs over the bad guy. We established that in part one, but I think that here I give you enough keys to understand exactly why. It's because if you look at the story of Dune and you're trying to read it through the lens of either heroism or villainy, you're going to be lost. I see that times and times again with people who try to produce analysis of the story where they either glorify Paul, which is questionable, or they think that they're doing the smart thing by saying, oh, 
Paul is actually the villain of the story. He's actually the anti-hero. That, to me, is also a clear proof that most people's media literacy nowadays is poor. Because the entire point of Dune is to convey the idea that there is no such thing as a hero. And so there is no such thing as a villain. It's all a question of perspective. It's all a question of whose roles do you agree with? I think it would be perfectly possible to argue, especially knowing what happens afterwards, that the Imperium and the Great Houses were right. They were right to try and maintain the status quo. And yes, it caused suffering, but Paul's decision, Paul's war, also caused suffering. And this is something that the story goes out of its way to tell you via the following quote. He was warrior and mystique, augur and saint, the fox and the innocent, chivalrous, ruthless, less than a god, more than a man. There is no measuring what deeps motives by ordinary standards. In the moment of his triumph, he saw the death prepared for him, yet he accepted the treachery. Can you say he did this out of a sense of justice? Whose justice then? Remember, we speak now of Muad'Dib, who ordered battle drums made from his enemy's skins. The same Muad'Dib who denied the conventions with a wave of the hand, saying merely, I am the Kwisath Haderach. That is reason enough. Based on this, I think that there is only one fair interpretation we can make of the story of Dune. And that is that Paul is a deconstruction of the myth of the hero. Losing sight of that fact is extremely dangerous. Because if you do, you're going to start buying into the myth. Something that the story also directly warns us against. Greatness is a transitory experience. It is never consistent. It depends in part upon the myth-making imagination of humankind. The person who experiences greatness must have a feeling for the myth he is in. He must reflect what is projected upon him. And he must have a strong sense of the sardonic. This is what uncouples him from belief in his own pretensions. The sardonic is all that permits him to move within himself. Without this quality, even occasional greatness will destroy a man. And that is the perfect transition to the last part of this video in which we'll discuss religion. A religion of people that unfortunately bought into the myth of their savior, which ultimately led to their own destruction. And here we are finally at the last part of this very long video, the one about religion. I'm going to be honest with you guys, I'm starting to fall apart a bit. So I went and I put some honey into the water, hoping it was going to soothe my voice and give me some energy. But like I have a ringing in my ears. So I'm going to power through this last part. It's a very interesting one, so I want to make it justice and I hope you're going to enjoy it. I suppose if you're still here at this point, that you are enjoying it. So I also want to thank you for sitting through my ramblings. I hope it's enjoyable. I hope as a fellow Dune fan, you're having a great time. I know that I am personally, even though it is extremely painful. So looking at religion, there are many in the world of Dune, but there is one that is clearly a priority in the plot because it drives the entire story forward. And that is the court of Muad'Dib, which is essentially a science fiction version of Islam. That doesn't take a genius to recognize, even if you're not a practicing Muslim yourself. If you have watched the movie, you clearly can tell that the entire thing is very inspired by Islam. Most of the terms are in Arabic and they're actually real. The Hajj, the Humma, these are real terms that Muslims use to describe their own faith. And so it is also not that surprising that Fremen culture would be extremely similar to Muslim culture which might explain why all of my favorite characters happen to be Fremen. Personally, my favorite of all time is Stilgar, and not the movie version. The movie version is very funny because it's goofy, but the book version is, in a sense, everything I want to be as a man. And if you're still there at this point, post in the comments who is your favorite character. That way I can tell the ones who actually were able to sit through the entire thing. 
However, just because I really like these characters and I also have a deep appreciation for Islam, both in the real world and in the fictional universe of Dune, doesn't mean that I'm going to let this enthusiasm blind me from the fact that the story also clearly works as a criticism against religion. And I hope, if you are Muslim or if you're a believer, that you will also make that effort. Do not let your own personal sentiment towards the religion that you love prevent you from criticizing the parts that might be dangerous to you or to your brothers. And we're going to start directly with this blasphemous part because it's unavoidable. In the story, the court of Muad'Dib and the entire Fremen religion is essentially a political tool. It's something that was implanted on Arrakis by the Bene Gesserit, who came and who manipulated the ways of the people to prepare them for the arrival of Poe and Jessica. There is even a quote-unquote job in the story that is a manipulator of religion, which conveys the notion that religions in themselves are not God-made. They don't come from the creator. They are always a creation of man, always for the purpose of acquiring power. This is what the Bene Gesserits call the Missionaria Protectiva. And when you witness the interactions between those who are aware of this plan and those who aren't, it is quite humorous and also quite sad at the same time. Because Jessica, the first time she arrives on Arrakis, has interactions with the natives. And what happens is that she plays this weird game of trying to figure out which words she is supposed to use to get them to believe that she is part of the prophecy. And when she does find these words, the natives enter a semi-trance. Because as the shout-out Mapes says, when one has lived with prophecy for so long, the moment of revelation is a shock. That is quite cynical. On one, hand, you have, on one hand, you have someone who has waited their entire life to be shown the arrival of their messiah. On the other, you have a person who is quite literally just like typing a code into a machine, waiting to get the reaction that they expect. And that is what makes religion such an efficient way to manipulate people. Because if you tell a set group of humans that a given set of action is going to occur in the future, and you know these actions preemptively, you can then just replicate them in front of them and they don't know better. They don't know that you are at the origin of the saying of the prophecy that you, in a sense, produced the trick. If you've ever heard of the term, it's a form of mental pareidolia. Pareidolia is when you look, for example, as a, at a thicket, at a bush, and you see eyes or you see a human face. Why? Because the human brain is designed to look and to recognize patterns that are in a sense, familiar to us in the unknown. So when you are faced as a religious person to a set of symbols or a set of patterns that resemble your prophecy, your brain is going to see in it the prophecy because that's how you've been trained. You've been manipulated to react in that fashion. Which is why, by the way, doomsday prophecies tend to stay as vague as possible. Because if they stay vague, it's much easier for you to read into the events of the prophecy and to see them in every occurrence of your life. But there are also other factors that make this strategy very efficient. So if the environment where the people live is extremely tough, like Arrakis, for example, then they're going to be much more likely to believe in a messiah because they want to be freed from this difficult living situation. Leading to our next quote. On the first day when Muad'Dib rode through the streets of Arrakis with his family, some of the people along the way recalled the legends and the prophecy, and they ventured to shout, Mahdi! But their shout was more a question than a statement, for as yet they could only hope he was the one foretold as the Lizan al Gaib, the voice from the outer world. So we see that one of the main levers of a prophecy is hope, because a messiah is supposed to bring a better life, and so the worse your life is, the most likely you are to believe in a messiah. However, the prophecy part is a very small portion of Fremen religion. The majority of it are strategies that were put in place for these people to survive their environment. And so we're going to leave the talk about Messiah for later on in the video. Right now, I want to focus on the consequences of that religion on the people because, and this is my personal belief, it doesn't really matter whether a religion is real or not. What matters is how it structures society. If it leads to a positive outcome for that society, then it's a good religion. If it leads to a negative outcome, it's a bad religion. As such, the way the Fremen approach their own religion 
is much closer to what I just described than an actual just blind belief or blind worship. Even their leader states that he prides himself on being a scientist to whom legends were merely interesting clues pointing towards cultural roots. So, if we accept that these words are true, then this also means that a messiah, outside of a prophetic figure, is also a very good indication of the nature of a people, because it teaches us a lot about who they are and the culture that they produce. What impresses the Fremen when they meet Paul is not just that he knows the words of blessings, it's not just that he matches the prophecy, it's also that he instinctively knows the ways of the desert. And that's quite meaningful to a people who had to suffer their entire life to learn these skills. To them, Paul being able to do this right off the bat is an omen. An omen that means if you follow this person, your life will be better. And this also extends to Paul's ability to see through falsehood which is incredibly important if you live a life of treachery, because what will kill you in the desert might be a worm, but most of the time it's not. It's going to be a slight detail, it's going to be the lack of water, things that an eye that can detect these small details can help prevent. Which is hard to understand for people like us, because we don't have to deal with death in our society, at least not that often. If anything, we push away the idea of death. It's the privilege of our comfort. Fremen don't have that privilege. They have to live with the notion of their own mortality because this is what could prevent it from happening. And so when you know that death could be around the corner, you have two choices. Either you enter a nihilistic perception of existence and you turn into a coward, or you just live with that knowledge and you accept it. The acceptance of death is a part of Fremen culture. Quote, when God hath ordained a creature to die in a particular place, he causes that creature's wants to direct it to that place. That is religion, yes, but to me, that is also a coping mechanism. This is psychology 101. So it's not just that freeman culture and religion allows them to survive the desert. It's also that it justifies the survival. It justifies the cruelty of their existence. It gives it a meaning. All of this is because this is what God wants, that has been ordained by God. If you're familiar with Islam, if you have Muslim friends, you might recognize that attitude, because Muslim men in particular tend to have it in them. It's a mentality, it's a cultural aspect that is promoted by Islam. Because the Islamic attitude towards fate is exactly that. It's one of acceptance. Since Allah is almighty and all-knowing, he is also in control of his entire creation. And that includes the future, your future. So Allah knows what will happen, he knows when it will happen, and he knows how it will happen. As such, you worrying about all of that is futile, because it's already been decided. If you live by this doctrine, your life will be freed from these unnecessary considerations. It's all in the hands of Allah. Right? You do your best, and after that, the Creator will do what He sees fit. And actually, this is a mindset that is extremely jarring when you come in contact with it for the first time. Something that we see in the scene between Tufir Awad and the Fremen, one of my favorite scenes in the entire story. Page 268. Does a man not know when he is worth saving? The Fremen asked. Your wounded know you have no water. He tilted his head, looking sideways up at Awat. This is clearly a time for water decision. Both wounded and unwounded must look to the tribe's future. The tribe's future, Awat thought. The tribe of Atreides. There is sense in that. He forced himself to the question he had been avoiding. Have you word of my duke or his son? Unreadable blue eyes stared upward into Awat. Word? Thou fate, Awat snapped. Fate is the same for everyone, the Fremen said. And that is this mentality in a nutshell, which I would describe as a form of mystical pragmatism. All of the Fremen roles, even the most bizarre, align with a need for survival. Sometimes these roles are impossible to understand for the non-Fremen, but they always make sense. As a result, because they are forced to be very matter-of-fact, the Fremen are also completely impervious to irony. 
At some point, Awad, who is started to get, starting to get tired of this Fremen he doesn't understand, tells the guy, hey, if you want a cannon from a Sardo car, then you should just go take one. And to that, the Fremen answers, yes, we took one. He doesn't understand that Awad was making fun of him, like saying, oh, you want one, go get one, as if, like, as if you could capture a Sardo car. The Fremen don't know. They're like, yeah, we captured one. And that's quite subtle, but this is a sign. Because usually, civilizations that are impervious to irony tend to be high vitality civilizations. Because usually, irony is also a defense mechanism against the meaninglessness of existence. Societies that are highly nihilistic tend to also be societies that are highly ironical. It's a way, in a sense, to exercise the existential dread by passing life as a big joke. I mean, this is not a good sign. It's a symptom that that civilization or group of people is dying. They are diseased. Compare it instead to the strength that emanates from Fremen culture. Paradise was sure for a man who died in the service of Lisan Gaib, the Fremen said. If it is the Lisan Gaib you serve, as you have said, why raise morning cries? The memory of one who died in this fashion will live as long as the memory of man endures. So we see here another defense mechanism. If someone is to die, there is no point in crying over it. It has happened. And on top of that, if they died in a just cause, then they haven't died in vain. And so they will be remembered. And this is all that matters. Which I think is paradoxical because you would think that a society that is highly nihilistic would also be one that is not afraid of death, but it's actually the exact opposite. High vitality civilizations tend to not shy away from death because they recognize that life is what it is. It is to be celebrated and lived. And if you are constantly afraid it's going to end, you're not actually living. You're already dead. This is what makes the Fremen such formidable warriors because if they can spend our life for the group of the tribe, so for the benefit of their civilization, then they will do it. They will not hesitate. Quote, it was the Fremen who took off in that captured thopter, Awad thought. He deliberately sacrificed himself. Great mother, what are these Fremen? A reasonable exchange, said the Fremen besides Awad. There must have been 300 men in that ship. Now we must see to the water and make plans to get another aircraft. And this might look callous, right? This, this very désinvolte approach to life, the existence of another being, but it's one that you have to adopt if you live in the desert. This also means that anyone who wishes to become a leader within Fremen society is going to have to be extremely strong, but also extremely wise. So there is no democratic election here. It's who is the baddest motherfucker of your troop. That person will lead the troop. And they will not just stay in power because they gained it once. They have to times and times again be willing to prove they're worthy of it. So the rest of the troop will challenge that person. And if that person fails, they die and they get replaced. That is how you ensure that your leader is always the best. And in return, the goal, the duty of the leader is going to be to protect the tribe. So you, it is in your best interest to make sure that the guy is actually solid. Another quote, page 356. My duty is the strength of the tribe, Stilgar said. That is my only duty. I need no one to remind me of it. This child man interests me. He is full-fleshed. He has lived on much water. He has lived away from the father's son. He has not the eyes of the hibad. Yet he does not speak or act like a weakling of the pants. Nor did his father. How can this be? So this is the leader of uh, Sichtabr, Stil Stilgar, who is mesmerized by Paul because, as I said previously, he thinks, okay, this is not someone that was trained in the ways of the desert. How come he's so powerful? If I can understand how, I can harness that strength for the good of the group. The quote continues, It is well that you see the reason, Stolgar said. We cannot dally here to test you, woman. Do you understand? We do not want your shade to plague us. I will take the boy man, your son, and he shall have my contenance, sanctuary in my tribe. But for you, woman, you understand there is nothing personal in this. It is the role is still in the general interest. Is that not enough? Paul took a half step forward. What are you talking about? 
Stolgar flicked a glance across Paul, but kept his attention on Jessica. Unless you've been deep trained from childhood to live here, you could bring destruction onto an entire tribe. It is the law and we cannot carry useless cut. So what he says here is that he is willing to take Paul because Paul can be of use. But the issue with Jessica is that she's not trained and she's now too old to be trained. So as a leader, it is his responsibility to recognize that she could become dead weight. And in a situation like the desert, one person could kill the entire troop because they would waste water on that person, because that person could trigger a worm, or they could attract a troop of Arkonnen, or God forbid, Sardokar. You cannot, as the leader, take that risk. But the second Jessica bests Tolgar in one-to-one -one combat, he immediately changes his mind. There's no ego in this. He thinks, okay, you bested me, this means that you are better than me, so you are important for the tribe. As he says, Jessica becomes worth 10 times her weight in water. This is what I would call selective xenophobia. The Fremen look at you, and if you're not part of the tribe, you are stranger, and so you are dangerous. But if they see that you can be of use, then you are no longer dangerous, you become useful. And the second you become useful, you become part of the tribe. That is the way they have to look at the wood. It's them versus everyone else. And I also think that this is the mark of a healthy society. If you have a society that just takes in anyone with no test whatsoever, your society is going to go to shit because you have no filter. And this also shows that you know your society sucks in a way because you accept everyone. If you go to a club and just about anyone can enter in that club, there is no value in being part of that club. It's the exclusivity that makes the rarity of the membership. And since the person that decides who gets membership is the leader, his word has a lot of value. Another quote. Out here, woman, we carry no paper for contracts. We make no evening promises to be broken at dawn. When a man says a thing, that's the contract. As leader of my people, I've put them in bond to my word. Teach us this wording way, and you have sanctuary with us as long as you wish. Your water show mingle with our water. In such a society, you don't need written contracts. We written contracts are for people who live in a low trust society because you cannot just take what the other person tells you at face value. You have to have a legal proof to force them to go through with the deal. In Fremen society, that does not exist. Someone gives you their word, that's their word. It's, it's, it's more solid than iron. Which is why it makes their society look so appealing. Until you understand that to be part of this entire system means being tested on a daily basis. Because in Fremen society, there are no civilians. Every single active member, including old people, women, and kids, are technically soldiers. Which is something that Jessica says at some point, a remark that she has that goes... Jessica listened to the sounds of the troop, hearing her own footsteps and paws, marveling at the way the Fremen moved. There were 40 people crossing the basin, with only the sounds natural to the place. Jessica noted, conserving her strength, sensing the terrible fatigue she held at bay by force of will. And she admitted it, by the force of elation. Her mind focused on the value of this troop, seeing what was revealed here about the Fremen culture. All of them, she thought, an entire culture trained to military order. So that naturally makes them quite the formidable opponents. But there are also negatives to such a society. One being that if you promote that type of training, you're also going to embolden individuals from within the culture, the tribe, who might be violent and who might make use of this violence to hurt other people. And yet we see that this doesn't happen. People are kept in check, and are kept in check through one thing, the leader. It's also the role of the leader to detect scorpions, individuals that might be dangerous to the group. Here's what Stolgar has to say about Jamis. There is too much violence in Jamis, too much gafla, the destruction. He gives his mouth to the rolls and his heart to the salfa, the turning away. When he gets this calving anger in him, he is a danger to his society. Having an eye for these traits, these sociopathic traits, is extremely important 
Because in a warrior culture, when you can literally challenge someone else legally without committing a crime and kill them, if you have people who enjoy killing for the sake of killing, soon enough there will be no longer any people to make the tribe functional. Which is why when Paul fights Jamis, Stolgar at the end panics a bit because he sees that Paul refuses to kill Jamis and he thinks, okay, does he enjoy toying with him? Does he enjoy inflicting suffering? Because if that's the case, I am about to welcome a scorpion in our midst and I'm going to put everyone in danger. It is later revealed that no, it's just that Paul actually had never killed anyone. And when that is told to the group, they are shocked because every single one of them has killed multiple people, but none of them has ever killed for pleasure. They only kill for the good of the tribe. I think we could learn from this because I think that one of the greatest flaws of modern society is that it no longer filters for sociopaths. If anything, sociopathy and psychopathy are now positive traits because they allow you to make it very far, especially in the corporate world. So instead of what they have, instead we have a system that promotes these tendencies, which also leads to a low trust society. You most likely lock your doors, you lock your car, you don't trust your neighbors. Why? Because you have no way to know the content of these people's character. But in Fremen culture, which is of course a fictional culture, that's not the case. Because you all follow more or less the, sa the same guidelines and you have all been tested. Because every single Fremen who enters the stage of adulthood has to go through the gum jabar. It has to be decided if they are an animal or if they are a human. But once that is done, you end up with a society that's outside of the desert and, and battle situation is extremely peaceful because within the siege, there is very little death. And on top of that, there is no precaution required to protect your own life. When Jessica and Paul make it to the siege, they remark that there are no snoopers. Snoopers are all things that detect poison in your food. The Fremen have no use for it because no Fremen would ever poison you. It wouldn't even cross their minds. And all of this, all of this culture is a direct consequence of the planet and the environment these people live in. This is why it is said that God created Arrakis to train the faithful. What must be understood from this is that you either embrace the Fremen lifestyle or you die. Or you die out in the sand. You don't really have another option. And that transformation you have to go through is not just cultural, it's also physical. The Fremen have a much lower body fat percentage, but also have much less water retained in their tissue because they've adapted to a low moisture context. It's also said that their sensitivity to pain and discomfort is much, much lower than the average person because they are constantly forced to wear a still suit and a still suit is extremely uncomfortable. It rubs against you all the time. Leading to the idea that it is water discipline, the necessity to preserve moisture that gave birth to Fremen culture. And so if we are to dive even deeper into that culture, we have to start discussing the importance of water. Now, I won't talk about the fact that water is money to these people. We've done that already in the part about Marxism. Instead, I want to focus on the ritualistic aspect of the thing, the meaning that water holds in the Fremen religion. According to the Fremen creation myth, water was the first of all things created. So beyond the evident need for the water, the reason why they rendered our dead is also because it's a way to honor the divine essence present in all of us. If you fail to do this, the spirit of the person might come back to haunt the tribe. At least this is what they believe. And so this ritual protects the tribe from destruction, both literally, because that way you have a justification to take the person's water, and symbolically, leading to another quote. At her place in the circle, across from Paul, Jessica noted, recognizing the ancient source of the rite, and she thought, the meetings between ignorance and knowledge, between brutality and culture, it begins in the dignity with which we treat our dead. She looked across at Paul, wondering, will he see it? Will he know what to do? We are friends of Jamis, Stolgar said. We are not welling for our dead like a pack of garvog. A grey-bearded man to Paul's left stood up. I was a friend of Jamis, he said. He crossed the mound, lifted the distance. When our water went below Minim at the siege at Two Birds, Jamis shared. The man returned to his place in the circle. 
Am I supposed to say I was a friend of James? Paul wondered. Do they expect me to take something from that pal? He saw faces turn toward him, turn away. They do expect it. An elbow nudged him and a voice hissed. Would you bring the destruction on us? So we see from this scene that what looks like a religious ritual is actually a way to strengthen the cohesion of the group because it reminds everyone that they're connected because it forces them to go through all of the struggle that they shared with their comrades which also works as a celebration of the life of the dead. It's what I was talking about previously. In Fremen culture, death is not a bad thing. We're not going to cry for you. Instead, we're going to celebrate your existence. Which doesn't mean that the Fremen don't mourn their dead, they just mourn them in a different way. Because crying is taboo in the desert. You're wasting a lot of moisture, and on top of that, you're making noise. So you're making yourself and your tribe known. Which is why when... Paul starts to cry, everyone is shocked, and they say he is giving moisture to the dead, which to them, again, is nonsensical, right? Because they have accepted the fact that once you die, your possessions are given to other people, and your water is going to join the water of the tribe. So you're not really dead, because you're still working towards the common dream and the common goal, which is to transform Arrakis into a green paradise. Quote 49. Dum, dum, dum. Jessica felt the religious ritual in the woods, noted her own instinctively odd response. They're in league with the future, she thought. They have their mountain to climb. This is the scientist's dream, and these simple people, these peasants, are filled with it. This was a dream for which men would die willingly. It was another of the essential ingredients that she felt her son needed. People with a goal. Such people would be easy to imbue with fervor and fanaticism. And here we go back into the prophecy, which is, quote-unquote, the worst aspect of Fremen culture. A diagnosis that Jessica makes, where she remarks that the strengths of the Fremen religion also makes them particularly susceptible to a false prophet. And she's not the only one who recognized that. Perdut Kynes, the father of Light Kynes, remarked upon looking at the religion that he created that no more terrible disaster could befall these people than for them to fall into the hands of a hero. And that is because Fremen culture possesses every ingredient to verse into fanaticism. They have a messianic prophecy, they have a dream of paradise on earth, and they have the warrior culture that bestows them the strength to accomplish these things with violence if necessary. Left dormant, these traits are not technically a problem, but if you put them in the hands of a warlord prophet, they have the potential to precipitate the jihad, the jihad that Paul was so afraid of. A jihad that, in a sense, he was invited to start. Paul hesitated before joining her on the ledge. He felt a sudden reluctance to be alone with this woman. It came to him that he was surrounded by a way of life that could only be understood by postulating an ecology of ideas and values. He felt that this Fremen wood was fishing for him, trying to snare him in its ways. And he knew what lay in that snare. The war jihad, the religious war he felt he should avoid at any cost. In this case, it would be because by becoming the prophet, the Mahdi, Paul also is going to have both political and religious powers in his hands. And when these powers are concentrated, usually bad things happen because now the word of God can serve as justification for the laws of men. And that inevitably leads to war because other nations are not going to be okay with this. They're not going to, to be okay with you basing your rules on a doctrine, on a court that they don't agree with. Which is exactly why the previous Fremen leader, Lyot, was a scientist. It's because his scientific-oriented mind was, in a sense, a way to blockade the jihad, to prevent the religious fervor to take root and to become overwhelming. This fervor was needed for the ecological dream to occur, but it had to be kept in check. And it was kept in check until Paul arrived. And Paul is no scientist. Paul is a mystic. He was trained to be a mystic. And as such, he's not in control of his own court. This is said in the story that he is becoming mythified as he exists as a living person. 
meaning that he too is caught in the movement. He is not in control to the point that even if he dies at this point of the story, it changes nothing. His death would be used as a religious justification to still enact the jihad. And Paul knows this. This is actually made very clear by the movie. He refuses to embrace the role of the prophet because he knows what this means. But he didn't really have a choice. Because once the Fremen started to believe in him as the Messiah, it was already too late. And all of their culture, all of their wisdom that tells them that speed is a device of shaitan, all of that went out the window. Because between picking a slow dream of a paradise that will occur in 500 years, or the promise of a prophecy with a messiah that might lead you to victory right now, after you've suffered for tens of thousands of years, which one are you going to pick? Well, the Fremen picked the warrior option. They picked the one that would satisfy their desires for revenge and also their desire for a paradise right now. And one of the most direct consequences of this decision is that the Fremen as a whole took the idea of collectivism to a whole new step because they all turned into the same person. They were all looking at Paul for answers and so they lost all of their individuality. All of that went out the window. And that is usually what a prophet does to people. Quote, When law and duty are one, united by religion, you never become fully conscious. You are always a little less than an individual. This is the nature of fanaticism. You are no longer a human. You are an agent of a terrible purpose. Your agency is no longer your own. You are just an instrument of your prophet. The prophet who himself becomes an instrument of the jihad. Because, as we established, he is not in control. And there is a very interesting piece of symbolism in the story of Dune that you might have missed. The Eye of the Hibad. The high of the Ibad is the blue in blue eyes that the Fremen get when they consume spice. And the symbolic behind it is the fact that they can no longer see perspective. Now their view of the wood is one dimensional. It is their religion and their prophet against the wood. Everyone else is wrong and they are right. Which is a remark made by Gurney Alec. Page 524. Us, Gurney thought. He means the Fremen. He speaks of himself as one of them. Again, Gunny looked at the spice blue in Paul's eyes. His own eyes, he knew, had a touch of the color. But smugglers could get offwards foods and there was a subtle cast implication in the tone of the eyes among them. They spoke of the touch of the spy brush to mean a man had gone too native. And there was always a hint of distrust in the idea. So once a man becomes deeply immersed in Fremen culture, he becomes Fremen and that becomes his identity. And since this identity was molded by culture, a culture that comes from a court, if that court promises the arrival of a messiah, once that messiah arrives, he takes over everything. And in a sense, he nullifies all of it as well. Because now this culture is no longer an instrument of survival, it's a weapon. And you see that with the behavior of the Fremen once Paul reveals himself as Muad'Dib. They become super protective of him. They never want to let him out of their sight. They never want him to face any danger because they know that if they lose him, they also lose everything, including, sadly, their ability to think. Another quote. The young man drew back from Paul as she came up to him and she found herself mentally dismayed by the new deference they paid him. All men beneath your position covet your station when the Bene Gesserit action but she found no covetousness in these faces. They were held at a distance by the religious ferment around Paul's leadership. And she recalled another Bene Gesserit saying, prophets have a way of dying by violence because this fanaticism can turn into hatred. But in Dune, it doesn't come to pass because Paul is extremely intelligent and so he knows how to manipulate these emotions. Which is, if you've watched the second movie, one of the greatest scenes of all times. I was hyped as fuck when I was watching it, which made me realize, oh, if I was Fremen, I would be susceptible to it. I would also be seduced by a prophet. Because it is in our nature to want to follow a strong and absolute leader. And I want, want, want to read that quote to you and hopefully make it justice. Again, Paul raised his voice. You think it's time I called out Stolgar and changed the leadership of the troops. 
Before they could respond, Paul hurled his voice at them in anger. Do you think the Lisa Nargaib that's stupid? There was stern silence. He's accepting the religious mantle, Jessica thought. He must not do it. It's the way, someone shouted. Paul spoke dryly, probing the emotional undercurrents. Ways change. An angry voice lifted from a corner of the cavern. We'll say what's to change. The good of the tribe, that is the most important thing, hey? Paul asked. Still with that flat voice dignity, Stilgar said, thus our steps are guided. All right, Paul said. Then who rules these troops of our tribe? And who rules all the tribes? I rule here. I rule on every square inch of Arrakis. This is my ducal fief, whether the emperor says yea or nay. He gave it to my father and it comes to me through my father. Will I subtract from our strength when we need it most? Paul asked. I am your ruler and I say to you that this is time we stopped killing off our best men and started killing our real enemies, the Arconans. In one blurred motion, Stolgar had his Chris knife out and pointed over the heads of the throng. Long live Duke Paul Muad'Dib, he shouted. A deafening roar filled the cavern, echoed and re-echoed. They were cheering and chanting, Yahaya Shuhada, Muad'Dib, 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 Yahaya Shuhada. Jessica translated to herself, Long live the fighters of Muad'Dib. This is the power of religion, this is the power of a prophet, this is the power of fanaticism. An entire people united in that moment with one goal. Not the goal of a green paradise, but the goal of destroying their enemies. Which, as we'll come to see, no spoilers, will be the downfall of these people. The irony being that that dream that was their original goal was achievable with just patience. They never needed Paul, and this is something that you might have missed, even if you read the book, because it's at the very end. When will we solve it? The Fremen asked. When will we see Arrakis as a paradise? In the manner of a teacher answering a child who has asked them some of 2 plus 2, Kynes told them, from 300 to 500 years. So it was true as this humor had said in the beginning. The thing would not come in the lifetime of any man now living, nor in the lifetime of their grandchildren eight times removed, but it would come. The course had been set by this time, the ecological Fremen were aimed along their way, Light kinds had only to watch and nudge and spy upon the Arconans until the day his planet was afflicted by a hero, at which point the ecological Fremen were turned into the fanatic Fremen, and the rest is history, or at least fictional history. But this being a fiction doesn't change the fact that this is a lesson that also applies to us. Because to me, the Fremen of Dune are a warning about the dangers of a religion that loses sight of itself. And this is a warning that I think we must heed. We like to believe ourselves as above this. We are technologically advanced. Well, guess what? This universe has 10 times our technology and it didn't prevent them from being taken over. Why? Because faith is the most powerful force in the universe. Which is something that the Bene Gesserit were keenly aware of and will also be our last quote of the day. When religion and politics ride the same cart, when that cart is driven by a living holy man, nothing can stand in their path. And that is going to conclude this now very long video. If you're still there, my salute to you. And if you for some reason want more and you're a glutton for punishment, you're going to have to be a little bit patient. As I said, this is part one. There's a part two that is just as long that I will be releasing at some point, but it will depend entirely on your reception. If this video is well liked and you're enthusiastic, I will put in the work to do the second one. And if it's not, I will just move on to projects that you guys care more about. But when it comes to telling me what you guys care about, the easiest way to communicate that to me directly is coffee. So if you like this video and you want part two, pledge, donate, and it will be my pleasure to put that in writing and in video form for you guys. That is going to be that for me. <laughs> I am so happy to be done. This was so fucking hard and so long. Why do I put myself through this? Well, I know the answer is because I love doing this shit and I love making videos for you guys and I absolutely love philosophy and I love Dune. But fucking finally, I'm going to be able to relax and rest a bit and go to the gym. I'm so excited. 
Peace to you guys. I'm going to see you very soon. Have a good night.